Hello, welcome yeah. to my podcast. I'm your host, Larry Liu. Today, I'm joined again by Mike Poole. Welcome to the podcast. Hey, Larry. Uh, yeah, so I, I would say um, th- there's a lot of touch-off points, but I think we, we might start just uh, talking about Byung Chul Han uh, yes. and um, you know, his uh, book about, I think it was titled Non-Things. Non-Things, um, yeah. And, uh, and I think... Yeah, he, he sort of puts together a lot of you know interesting arguments. Um, one of which is um, the, the the fact that you know social media communication and you know instant connectivity uh, through you know using you know social media or internet services um, you know makes us socially isolated. Um, that there there is no grander community uh, to be uh, part of, um, and it sort of leans back on an argument that um, another theorist made, Hannah Arendt, mm-hmm. and the origins of totalitarianism, where she basically argues that you know a big part behind you know the rise of kind of Nazi and fascistic thinking was the lack of social integration among a you know big subset of the population right it's people that were you know unemployed or they were you know had a weak attachment to the labor force they were not union members uh you know there wasn't like a strong church anymore because the society was secularizing rapidly um and then the state at that time was also providing only minimal social services during a time of distress the great depression um and uh, all of these factors together sort of favor the rise of you know fascistic uh, ideology um and you know and, and today we are seemingly in a very similar situation right where you know we have one of the most you know connected generations in history because of the uh you know social media the instant communication um and yet you know this was still the time when you know, Trump is rising in, in the United States, but then you also have um, the AFD movement in Germany. Um, so you have sort of like the nationalistic uh, uprising that you were seeing uh, in the developed world. Um, and, and a lot of that having to do with the, um, I would say, the reinforcement of the social isolation. Uh, right. That's that that's part of the, you know, uh, this modern internet culture, um, uh, yeah, and, 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 and now I mean I, I'm I'm not sure like how deep he goes into like, like a critical analysis of of, of capitalism itself. Now I mean you know because yeah. I mean obviously like, if you want to write about capitalism as a whole, I mean you, you know, there's like a whole book that has to be written about that, um. But the extent to which, you know, there, there's 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 no economic security, right? You know, we're like in a liquid society, as Bauman calls it, the risk society in the Beck framework. Um, yeah. and uh, there's 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 a lack of, um, yeah, social safety net. There's a lack of, uh, overall, you know, the overarching community that you can sort of. Uh, drawn for your uh, personal needs, um, and uh, and and that's sort of one of the biggest uh, disorders of the contemporary society, right? Um, uh, yeah. is, is it something that you wanted to emphasize? Yeah. Uh, um, so thanks for introducing me to this philosopher. I uh, never read his works uh, before, but I did have a chance to review uh many of uh the passages from the book that uh, non things and uh there's definitely an influence of critical social theory and uh, actually there as you said uh it echoes zygmunt bauman's uh you know liquid modernity uh, idea but you know what else when i read it it kind of echoes manuel castell's network society uh thesis that was written in the year 2000. And uh, you recall that book, that that book also kind of went into 
this uh, view that the internet, the internet was is going to radically change things and, and often will you know change the way we we view things and interact and it's the new you know big bang if you like but i i think uh that kind of criticism that Bijun Chul uh, Han makes in this this book is that think of it like a synthetic society we are engaging more and more with artificial like social media you know we're we are losing touch with other humans. And he had actually this scene in the documentary that I watched that was really good. He went back to South Korea and he was looking at the way things people are purchasing everyday items on their cell phones. And one of the things he was arguing is that everything is artificial and it's almost like a, a futuristic world where you can literally you know, purchase things uh, using your phone. Everybody does this nowadays. So we're losing real objects and real meanings and real material objects as real things and we're trying to replace those with artificial you know synthetic things that we see on a screen and that creates distance alienation and, and problems and we don't uh think about you know the real world real objects and real humans and we start to yeah get consumed by it and i think that's where he was really turning into this critical social perspective, the consequences of it, right? So, uh, of course, there's other books that I didn't have a chance to fully review at yet, but I'm really looking forward to it. This this, this philosopher really uh, brings back, you know, some classic uh, thinkers, including the Frankfurt School. He sometimes brings in, uh, uh, you, can, you can sometimes tell Ardono several, several occasions, uh, but other thinkers, too. I mean, just across. Mary's a philosopher, so he's not like a sociologist, but he has a grand, you know, understanding of philosophy. So I'm really amazed. But I, I enjoy it. I'm really enjoying uh, reviewing some of his works right now. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I would say Perhaps. that he's, 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 I mean, if he called himself a sociologist, I mean, I would gladly claim him as part of the tribe. Um, yeah. Because uh, the intersection between, you know, philosophy and sociology, um, it, I mean, it's very large. I mean, if you defend your doctorate in sociology, uh, it will always be a PhD, right? You would still right, right. primarily considered to be a philosophy doctorate, which suggests that your know, two disciplines um, have the same roots, which same is ultimately philosophy. Roots. I mean, philosophy... Uh, stayed in its own turf and then sociology emerged uh, from the philosophy turf um and uh, and so i think that because i mean a lot of good sociology is always about social theory right um and uh you know social theory yeah i mean if you go back to you know marx uh, one of our founding fathers i mean he had a phd in philosophy right um and and yet sociologists are very proud to claim him as part of uh, their founders, um, you know, Weber was a was a legal theorist, so he came from uh, the the law, the law school tradition. But um, but evidently, I mean, being knowledgeable enough about you know, like philosophy about religion, right? Sociology of religion. So um, so yeah, I mean, I I I wouldn't necessarily put such a grand boundary between the uh, disciplines. Um, yeah, I, mean, I I've not seen the documentary about uh, that 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 Han produced. Uh, yeah, but I would certainly like to see that, and uh, you know he uh, is sort of a great you know original thinker who you know uh, synthesizes a lot of ideas from uh, other uh, great scholars um, to basically uh, provide intelligent uh, social commentary. Um, because I mean, for a course that I'm preparing about classical social theory, I mean, I have to make a selection about you know what is part of the classical social theory canon, uh, and um, and just reading, you know, the old works again, you know, like Simmel, Marx, Durkheim, Weber, um, it uh, it it kind of reminds you again. Well, first of all, like why, you know, I enjoy the subject of sociology. Um, namely because because it sort of addresses the big question, the big foundational question, right? Which is, 
you know, how do you retain enough social coherence? You know, I guess social solidarity in the Durkheimian framing uh, in a world that uh, basically shatters, you know, social coherence, um, you know, mainly by, you know, concepts like individualism, by, um, you know, rationalization, right, which is about optimizing on, on numbers, optimizing on GDP growth and population growth and so forth. Um, but then even in personal life, you know, optimizing on the perfect job, optimizing on your you know, life partner, uh, optimizing on like what location you want to live in, the housing that you live in, etc. So, um, and, and, and all of these things are, you know, intensely, you know, isolating, individualizing experiences that, um, that in our social brain uh, is, um, it, 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 it's highly stressful, right? I mean, it poses the, um, you know, this issue of alienation, right? Um, from, uh, for, for, from 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 natural activities, which um, which I think is is being bound up with a small tribe of people. Ultimately, I mean, you need hundred to hundred fifty people that uh, um, you know, like your own like little village, your own little community uh, that uh, uh, cares for your you know mental, spiritual well being, etc. Um, and uh, and for some reason, I mean. You know, over many years of modernization and the growth of wealth, we are taking away these, uh, you know, social, you know, bonds uh, yeah. that uh, that used to make up society, right? Uh, and don't mean to interrupt you. Uh, you know, Ryan reminds me of pennies. You know, that transition from uh, Gemeinschaft to Gesellschaft. You know, uh, Tunney's, uh classic uh, author. I really recommend. And this 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 tension between the community as being kind of unified, uh, integrated, right? And modern society, the, the Gesellschaft is, as a consequence, is often very disintegrated, is more fragmented. So yeah, very. By the way, I recommend that author. That that that, that is a classic. Yeah, but Tony's, it's part of his syllabus. Yeah. Tony's is uh, really works on this dichotomous, you know, very dichotomous thinking. Um, but yeah, you 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 nailed it. I think uh, there's definitely lots of uh, classic sociologists that still can help us to explain phenomenon in in the modern world. You know, even though they're dead, <laughs> 150 years in some cases, right? Yeah, I mean, because years, the, the the fundamental force, right, of yeah. rationalization and you know individualization, right? Um, uh, you know the, the the drive of of capital to continuously grow. Uh, I mean the, the, those forces are underlying a lot of uh, you know the motivations that uh, that institutions have, right? So you know whether it's universities, whether it's companies, whether it's countries, um, you know, uh, you know all of them are sort of on the same logic, on the same trajectory of. Uh, growing figures of growing numbers um social uh, change right? yeah yeah so i so in the, in the neighborhood in princeton i mean uh so I, is it, there's this one area that i always bike across uh from my weekly bike rides and um and when when i started it was you know a couple of years back um it, 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 there's this one road where on the side you only have the trees it's like a full tree coverage Right, which I mean, which is very nice, like during hot summer days, because you know at least part of the way you can ride in the shade. Um, but now that road, it's like they, um, basically cut down the the, the tree lines. Uh, so now it's like in the summer day. I mean, it's like you have the full, you know, uh, if you ride in the middle of the day, it's like you have the full uh, sun heat exposure. Uh, and why are they doing that? Well, so they're clearing the tree lines. Uh, they're creating senior living facilities. Uh, and they already put up the sign that says, you know, for leasing, right? <laughs> All uh, right. And then on the other side, they they say they want to open up a new apartment uh, complex, which is going to open finish up next year. Where the same thing. I mean, they put up the advertisement. 
uh, you know, the name of the apartment and it's like open for leasing. And you can definitely tell that like, you know, in the old days, I mean, when you had a lot of the, 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 the tree line coverage, um, you would always see the, 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 the animals, um, yeah. what's that? The, the deer, you would have always yeah. have the, the, the deer. Wildlife, yeah. yeah. They're running around, et cetera. And there's, now they're displaced. <laughs> yeah, they're, well, they're being well, they're being pushed out a little bit further, right? Um, yeah, to, to make space for you know human civilization, I guess. Um, and 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 even that, it's like like you know, this is a small town up in Princeton, but it sort of reminds me of, you know, what is the, what is the inherent human logic, right? What is the logic of the human system, and yeah. and this was so beautifully illustrated just by. Yeah, by 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 seeing you know land use changes and um it's, and I mean the simple idea that you know th that the forest you know like it's a plain forest doesn't pay any rent, right? Um, doesn't make right. Money. Um, and and now that if the population is growing, I mean if the student body let's say is increasing, right? So they need more student housing. Um, so that's why I mean half of the campus in Princeton is basically um construction zone. Um, because they erect new housing for you know new students, new college programs, etc. So it's all in that growth logic, right? Yeah, and rapid social change, definitely. By the way, I see the same thing uh, here in North Texas in Metroplex, uh, exploding uh, with with population growth, and like you said, it has consequences for the ecosystems here. And surprisingly, this has caused problems even in Texas. Uh, have coyotes uh, and wildlife that often comes back into many of these areas that were developed uh, with housing, but you still have this wildlife that creeps back uh, in areas that are not like very much developed now. So Texas, the Metroplex, for instance, where I live, very much visible. Like you say, things are changing. Housing is going up everywhere, uh, development and you know, what impact it has on our ecosystem and, uh, you know, next decades, what, what consequences this will have, you know, you know, we'll get to see it, hopefully most of it. <laughs> uh, so yeah, definitely, definitely. We see it. So that's, that's important because I think with sociologists in sociology, we have these existing theoretical frameworks that helps us to explain often the change including Chicago School of Sociology, I think is a classic place we can start, you know, and uh, others. The, the the city itself is a living, breathing entity. You know, the city is breathing, it's changing, and, but we all live in cities most of our lives, right? So most of us will probably live in cities, work in cities, study, and pro eventually die in cities. I think that's the prognosis you know some of us may live in suburbs or uh rural areas but most people i think end up living in cities and um, it's also a big question like where the social problem locations are being focused um because um i mean okay so if you think about the french riots right that happened so from last month onward right um right where we are basically the you know, similar to what happened in the States, right, a couple of years ago, right, where the police basically shot one of the uh, residents, uh, one of the, uh, I think, Maghreb uh, migrants, um, mm -hmm. migrant background communities. I mean, a lot of them are actually French citizens, right, second generation. Um, and, uh, and then there was a big riot after that against the state, against the police, etc., um and uh, and then and then, and then it's very interesting to look at the uh spatial locations where the um you could say the problem regions um the uh, where, where social uh disadvantage is concentrated yeah. uh, and you can see that you know th th that is the the ban the banlieues they call it right so these are kind of like the suburban regions of paris right um where the um, you know the the rents are presumably lower, so that people, working class people, uh, can can live in them. Uh, and that's usually where 
uh, the disadvantage gets concentrated. Yeah. Um, well, in the U.S., I mean, it seems to be the opposite, right? Where the people who have the money, the middle class, the upper middle class, uh, they they take off for the suburbs, right? Because you know, like, because because in the U.S., I mean, the expectation kind of is you know we have lots of land, right? Um, and if we want to get anywhere, we just drive our cars, right? So, um, and and, and so, you know, you always wanted to, you know, spread out with distance, uh, and then that way you can, you know, keep out the, you know, the plebeians, you know, the the the, the lumpen proletariat, right? The lumpen proletariat, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you 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 can keep out uh, the the people that are, um, you know. The, the the poor right um and uh and, and and then you have a problem right because then the people that are then left in their inner city neighborhoods uh you know have like full disadvantage right because i mean the problem is i mean i mean so the, the ideal social setting is i mean if you have social mixing right so you have people from you know like the wealthier people like the middle class and the working class lower class yes all together because because you have the purchasing power base right uh that is like evenly spread um but the problem is i mean if you only have poor people that are concentrated in a certain neighborhood um then there's a very bad neighborhood vibe that gets created right because then the only industries that you can have is you have one or two bodegas you know one few dollar stores yeah. yeah dollar stores or something right um uh and, and then and then and then you might have like you know prostitution you have drug sales um and then you might have a concentration of homeless populations um and and and, and, and then you and then you can have you know gang violence you can have street violence you know guns are easily accessible um and then there's also yeah. and, and that drives out the remaining businesses because there's no point in Running a business, if you get robbed and or there's yeah. shootings outside, um, so so yeah. I, so so by the way, that that has been an issue even here in uh, the metroplex. Uh, there's some grocery stores that refuse to develop in areas where they think there will be a loss of profit, and so uh, one of the WalMarts uh, closed down. I think uh, uh, in central Dallas, there was lots of theft. And a rare occasion where Walmart does shut down, and this in this in this location it did shut down. So yeah, there's definitely uh, a concern of uh, uh, for business when it happens. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And then the as consequences, the city, has consequences, I mean. you know, has, has detrimental consequences because then those residents in that community lack access to a grocery store, you know, uh, and the the food uh, deserts grow. In some instances, the long distances that people have to drive to go to the grocery store becomes more extreme in in, in poor neighborhoods. Definitely, yeah. Yeah, that's the right. Um, that's, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah. as a mayor of the city, I mean, like one of yeah. your major concerns is to, you know, bring down crime because uh, you know w w without being able to do so, I mean, you you're gonna you're going to have a downward spiral because I mean, if the businesses are shutting down, you know, they're moving out yeah. to the suburbs. So your tax base is declining. I mean, the, the only way I could uh, deal with that issue is, I mean, if there's some like state level centralized taxation that then, you know, redirects funds back into, you know, the, the local communities, especially the ones that are de more deprived economically, um, that would be one way of going about it. But in most cases, um, you know, there's not a lot of state or federal level allocations. Um, mm -hmm. And in fact, I mean, a big part of this, you know, Ronald Reagan kind of uh, revolution, you could say, is about, um, mm -hmm. uh, it's about defunding, you know, city governments effectively. Um, and, and, and from the federal Austria. side. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 and then, and, and then the big cities are, are, are in trouble, right? I mean, you know, because you you have enormous amounts of resource needs. Um, uh, the, the, there's a lot of like infrastructure, like public wow. housing, hospitals, um, schools, etc. I mean, you have to sustain all of these social services while you're, um, 
tech space, the residential tech space, the business tech space is kind of eroding, disappearing, eroding. right? Um, yeah. So, um, so I mean, it, and, and 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 then you have to be creative with survival, but it's not going to be you know that that effective. Um, so um, then the only hope that you then have is. Well, I mean, it, it it would be some version of gentrification, right? I mean, there would be have to be some neighborhoods where you can attract, um, you know, maybe with some tax Wealthy incentives. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you you would you would invite like professionals uh, to kind of come back. Um, you would maybe you know make sure at the beginning that there's enough you know for these resources that are available uh, to yeah. ensure safety. Um, yeah, and and then hopefully there's going to be some kind of positive cycle that gets created. But then if you but then if you advance the gentrification, it's like okay, well you're increasing the amount of tax revenues that's available to your community. But then at the same time, you know you are going to displace the the people that live low in low income, the, yeah, residents, neighborhoods, yeah, and in, in those gentrifying neighborhoods that are low income. Everything right? has costs and benefits, <laughs> right? Or consequences, unintended consequences. There you go. Yeah, yeah. definitely. So, well, then the the solution would have to be. Um, I mean, I always go back to the Viennese housing policy. I mean, I was. Yeah. This is like one of the, you know, uh, well, it was developed over a hundred years ago. Um, when the Social Democrats won the elections, uh, in I think it was after World War One. Um and that you know government program of providing public housing has been yeah. one of the most successful you know urban housing uh, programs in the world I would say um because by ensuring that you know but maybe one third of the residents I could say uh being able to live in uh in public housing you can you know relieve a significant amount of pressure. From the private rental market, um, right. you know, yeah. yeah, especially uh, if you, I don't mean to interrupt you. Especially if you think about that, most Americans, uh, working class Americans, uh, I think, will spend more than half of their paycheck just on rent. And when rent goes up, they have very little disposable income to spend. Right. So if a large chunk of their income goes directly into paying for rent. Uh, you know, you think of the consequences that people don't have spending money. They don't have spending money to pay for uh, cars and stimulate the local economy because most of it goes back in their rent, <laughs> right? But with public housing, the idea is, is that you try to like curtail the amount of money that people spend uh, based on their income. And that's why I think it's a great model, the Red Vienna model of public housing, because then at least you can curtail the amount of money that people have to spend on rent and it doesn't, you know, go with speculation or, uh, yeah, private profits kind of motivations. Yeah. But then the flip side of it is that, so, yeah. um, you have, so two thirds, a home ownership rate in the U S um, right. I mean, in, in Germany and Austria, I would say it's less, it's probably like a third or so. I mean, it's, it's definitely much less uh, so I don't have the numbers in my head, but, uh, Home ownership certainly higher in the in the provinces in the rural provinces than in Vienna, for instance. I mean, Vienna is basically. I mean, you have like a few like rich people that own like like you know the the, the top layer of like a condo building or something, right? Um, mm -hmm. but uh, but it's generally rare to to have actual housing. I mean, I visited a few friends that uh, that that have acquired. Housing, they're in like out outer lying districts, not in the central districts. Um, but yeah, it's 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 always unaffordable for most people to uh to afford um like their own home, like actual home ownership. Yeah. Uh, and and renting, I mean, especially in large cities, is probably the most uh common way of of living. Um. To that, I would say. Hmm, I mean, it really depends, right? So I I think that if you have rents that are low, right, um, because of the, you know, the availability of the public housing facilities, right, 
Um, I would say that you would still be better off uh, than renting for most of your life uh, than if you were, um, you know, holding a home mortgage. Mm -hmm. Because it, 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 the flip side is, okay, so you, so you buy a house, you know, you take out a 30-year mortgage. And, um, and especially the first 10 years or so, I mean, I would say probably most of the money that you're paying back in the mortgage um, after making your down payment is uh, is the interest uh, that goes to the bank, to, to, to the lender, right? Um, so then you're like, okay, you know, do I want to be exploited by, you know, you could say the city government uh, as a, as, as my landlord um, or, or some private landlord, or do I want to be exploited by the bank? Uh, right in the mortgage um or some private equity firm huh? <laughs> right <laughs> yeah that's right so yeah. uh, and you also have to consider that in a lot of countries i mean i think in the us you can choose but i think in like i know in the uk for instance where you know i i, I think the only option for the home mortgages is the uh is the flexible market interest rates which I mean, you, you can imagine how terrible that is, right? Because if you, let's say if you, like, with the year you buy a house, you know, you get a nice interest rate. Let's say you know whatever three, four percent. And you're like, oh, that's great. You know, I can I can pay that easily. Um, and then, and then for some reason, because of you know changes in government policy, now all of a sudden it's like seven, eight percent, right? Right. Uh, and, and and then you're in trouble, right? So. Uh, Larry, let me let me ask you a, a question. Just because you have knowledge of Austria, is it fair to say that in Austria, both students and the elderly, fifty percent probably make up as renters? That 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 population of students are usually already in public housing or Studentenwerk or some university uh, set up where they get housing through university. And the elderly, particularly in Austria, are they very much like fifty percent or more? Is that a, is that a correct estimate, or is it, am I? I'm trying to make a comparison between Austria and Germany because I know in Germany, there's also a higher population of students that depends on public housing, usually through the university. Uh, and elderly, definitely, I think is a rough estimate. Might be fifty percent of the elderly end up usually in public housing of some sort uh is that is that fair or is that dissimilar in austria like uh students usually are renters or they're in a public housing situation and the elderly or is that not not not, not the same well i mean so it really depends so if okay. you like, let's say if you, if you come from the province um yeah. like let's say from you know steiermark or something and then you go study in the University of Vienna, I mean, you'll be away from your family and yeah. uh, and, and then you won't be, you know, you obviously won't be commuting from, from Steiermark. So, uh, so then you're going to have to get an apartment. Um, uh, uh, I so think it's not, that, it's not, not student apartments, right? They have that too, right? Uh, like they there's have, a few, there's a few people that might live in student uh, apartments, apartment. but I think the most common okay. form is that they find, you know, private rental okay. housing. Um, or, um, yeah, in order to get into Gemeindebau, which is the public housing, I think that, uh, there's uh, some elaborate bureaucratic process that's involved uh, to waiting list. Well, like the that. Of, there's a quite a waiting list nowadays because uh, there's a lot of uh, demand now, uh, because the city is still growing, right? I mean, you still have yeah. a growing population, um, and uh, there's going to be quite a bit of competition in order to uh, you know, obtain housing um so but but, uh, but i mean like i i think one of the main ways to regulate this you know like how students can afford housing i think would probably be uh the the, the housing no not the housing but the student stipend right yes yeah. there's, there's a student stipend that the state uh pays for um now it's it's, it's but i don't think it's going to cover a huge chunk of the rent. I mean, it might just cover just enough of the rent, and then, and then you you know for the food and for the remainder yeah. of the rent, you know, you might have to you know do, work a part time job or something. Yeah. Well, the reason why I bring this up, the memories that I have, this is back early, early two thousands, 
is a lot of German students live in Wohngemeinschaft, a WG, a WG, and is where they kind of double up in an apartment and they have five or six people living and they get, uh, as you know, uh, Wohngeld. Uh, so sometimes you get a, a living subsidy. So it's a kind of subsidy to pay for a fraction of the, 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 the housing cost. Uh, but a lot of the students often are in this kind of uh, community apartment where there's a lots of people together. That's in the big cities. I don't know about the smaller cities, but yeah, I, but I, I, I think in Vienna you would you would have same, that same thing. Yeah. yeah, so it's it's very different than the U.S. I mean, you do have uh, more. You do have student housing. You know, everybody knows. Often universities that's a that's a uh, sometimes offered as student housing, a room and board, right? But it is often off campus housing, right? That's more for profit. Uh, but there's very little public housing. You know. Uh, for students outside of the university, right? So a lot of students in the U.S., they often have to look, like you said, they have to look for private, you know, uh, houses that are available or rental market, whatever is out there, right? So that often may put them in a, at a disadvantage, especially if they're working class and they want to go to a big university or college, the costs or housing costs make up a big portion of the the whole education cost, if you like, Right. So I don't know. It's a big, it's a big topic. It's a big topic. The fraction of the housing versus tuition and fees. You put all that into a bucket, you know, it becomes expensive. Uh, so, so yeah, big issue. Well, I mean, that, that that's, that, that's yeah. a big headache for sure. I mean, yeah. um, especially, I mean, like the Princeton university town, I mean, you know, if you want to get a one bedroom, I mean, you're at, at, at least two thousand, two thousand five hundred is kind of with no utilities, right? Is, yeah, without utilities. I mean, so uh, it, 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 it's a rough yeah. situation. So then you can do yeah. the shed rental. I mean, the shed rental. I mean, you're at you know, I mean, when I started, it was like six fifty, so it was a good, mm -hmm. it was a good deal. And um, nowadays, I mean, I see, I see listings that are like thousands, you know, more than a thousand at this point. Uh, so. Yeah, it's a big, uh, big job. Yeah, even for shed rental, it's it's quite, it can be quite expensive. Um, yeah, and uh, you're on the East Coast, so East Coast is definitely uh, more harsh uh, as far as, I guess, supply demand of housing in general than, I mean, here in the South, but East Coast, it seems like it's always been more higher, even, even the Pacific, like Seattle and San Francisco. I can't imagine having to study and looking for a house or a rental uh, or New York, New York, even right. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think it's much n nicer, perhaps in in regions where there's a lot of like, you know, empty land, and so the population density is lower. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, then you know you could you could get lower cost of living. Uh, but then you also have to consider that, you know, if, if you live in a location where there's lots of land. Well, then the sprawl is much more. So then, you know, yeah, you also yeah, because you have to factor in, you know, the, the the car transportation is, you know, part of the overall budget, right? Um, oh, yeah. So, which I mean, like, it, 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 because I have friends in New York City that, you know, found jobs there and like you know companies and stuff, and, uh, and most of my friends don't own cars over there, um, which. Would be foolish anyway because i mean because you'd be snarled up in the traffic anyways i mean so the fastest way to get around is like by taking the subway or by Plus. riding your bicycle right but but i mean if you but if you drive a car i mean you're not gonna move anywhere then it's very hard to find parking right um well, so <laughs> yeah and it would be expensive parking to find it right yeah. yeah. So, uh, so yeah. And in New York City, therefore, is is purposefully not a very, you know, car friendly culture. Um, but then, but then, but then, I, I would still say that the overall cost of living is still higher because, yeah, the money that you're saving on the, on on, on the gas in the car is gonna go to the rent, right? The rent is substantially higher. I mean, maybe two or three times higher than what you find in other places. All right. Uh, so. 
Yeah, I mean, if you, I mean, if you, I mean, but if you look at professional jobs, for instance, I mean, like you know, you're not gonna find professional jobs that pay you know less than you know hundred thousand dollars, let's say, right? I mean, I guess they're like, well, okay, if we want these people to come work here, you know, they have to be able to afford to live here. Not, and the question is, okay, well, what do you do? You know, with the lower income residents, who are not professional jobs, uh, so, um. You know, you would basically let them commute, you know, for for a longer time. You know, just, yeah. let, them, let them move out a little bit further. I mean, that's kind of what they're doing in the West Coast, right? I mean, like, you know, because you get the Silicon Valley, right? You get the you get the people that are, you know, living there that are well off, right? The professionals, and then and then you have the whatever the bus drivers, the cleaners, uh, the restaurant workers. It would be commuting from far away right um and you know sometimes for several hours um and also homelessness i think is also a problem right where you have people that are working full-time jobs but they're living you know in the trunk of the car basically right yeah um so horrible yeah is, is it sort of like priced out of the housing market yeah yeah it's it's, it's not very well designed i think you know that um uh, you know, housing. I mean, you cannot leave. At least the question like housing. I mean, I don't. I don't think you should leave that up to the free market. Um, because mm. I mean, I mean, free market. I mean, it's, it's like of course, free market is great. Like if you have the money, right? So I mean, if you if you should say, okay, we only care about the well being of the richest ten percent of society, then you're like, yeah, okay. Then of course we want to have a market solution for everything, right? Um. But if you're saying, well, I mean, actually, no, I mean, it's better to live in a society where everybody can have a stake in it. So, yeah, uh, then then you don't want to leave at least the housing, uh, you know, system to to the market, right? I think it's one of those fictitious commodities which Palani talked about, right? <laughs> right. Well, yeah, land, labor, money, you put uh, housing in there, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, it would be covered under land, right? Um, yeah. So. Uh yeah, the idea that if you if you take a piece of land and then you can put you know commodity value, you can put some you know price uh, on that land. Um, right, and and it's going to be very distorting, right? Because um, you know, like how do you make a decision about how to price the land, right? So, I mean, so some yeah. What know, what surprised? Uh, not to interrupt you, by the way. What's surprising for me? I mean, because I. I often commute throughout long distances throughout Texas. And because there is an enormous amount of land, you often see these signs, you know, for sale 100 acres plus or for sale, you know, 60 acres. And in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, you know, like uh, that's a lot of money usually made just off the land. And we don't ever really know the use value, what is going to be the use of selling it and who, who's what that person's going to do with it or uh, what's going to be developed on it, you know. Uh, but even land is often very speculative. And I see it because you can see the signs and you and Texas is very enormously big. I mean, it's huge, right? You're talking, I think this was it the third largest state, I think. But there's an enormous amount of land and it's it's constantly for sale. So there's a lot of money and speculation just on the, man, uh, the land aspect. Um and with land, you you get rights. So with land, you often you know start chopping down trees, or you you have access to the water resources, or you exclude others from uh, resources, things like that. So it's often interesting, just the issue of land and the consequences of you know if it's just always seen as a commercial uh, has a commercial value uh, in itself for people that are engaged in real estate sales. You know, it's a big big money maker. So, and I see that when I commute, like when I commute, sometimes I see these signs and it's just it's like a whole forest, you know, that's really, or I would say just untouched land that hasn't yet been developed. And there's a sign, it's like 150 acres for sale. And I was just in the mind, I think, okay, how much value would that be? You know, who can afford that? Probably 20 million, you know, I mean, or whatever value people want to put on that land, but what do they actually do with the land? 
you know, or uh, and what benefit does it have for the for the communities? That's that's a philosophical question, right? Uh, maybe next time we gotta try to invite uh, Carl Witterquist and get his uh, get him on board. He has a long, extensive book on the prehistory of private property, which that's I really true. recommend. Yeah. I really recommend that one. Yeah. Maybe one day we can invite him, you know, and he get he get, give us a, a good historical uh, breakdown <laughs> on the prehistory of private property, which, by the way, that book is online, I think. But I've been reading it and I was thinking about just land, the, just the massiveness of it as a as a value that we often don't take uh, seriously. And when it's, you know, speculated away and when it's abused and, you know, polluted uh you know we have second thoughts of how we treat land and you know land is here now but one day we'll be gone and the next generation will have access to the land and the resources even a place like texas has a, a, an abundance of land resources available um but who decides what to do with it it's always going to be quite even the water resources you know yeah i mean uh, if, you, go ahead if you want to analyze like the problematic nature of you know land tenure land ownership etc i mean it's always useful to uh yeah compare sort of like like native american traditions versus kind of like the western european traditions um that sort of you know interfered with the native american tradition um where i mean essentially i mean the idea I mean, this is what was discussed in the Lanz and Precht podcast that I was listening yeah. to before we started the talk, um, where basically the so, so the Native Americans they they lived on the land, but they did not have ownership stakes. They did not have ownership claims over you know the North American you know territory. Um, they thought of themselves as being shepherds of nature, right? Which is some kind of divine creation, right? Um, and um, and therefore you have to be very stringent regarding you know conservation, right? Like basically, I mean, if you draw water, you know, you only draw as much as you need, uh, and uh, and you know, and allow you know fields to That's like awesome. replenish. Right, and also human populations should be kind of limited to some extent. I mean, um, because you know, then that minimizes the uh, overall impacts on uh, on the soil. Um, and and then the the European ideology that was sort of superimposed on the on the native traditions um, was the idea that, well, first of all, that there's this idea of private property, right? that you can take a piece of land uh, and then the state will assign exclusive ownership rights to specific individuals. And that specific individual then is entitled um, based on this Lockean principle of mixing labor and land. Right? So the simple idea of like cultivating the land, growing yeah. food, basically, that's basically what it means. Um, and you're know, raising uh, cattle, etc. First uh, pro proprietors, is that what it's called? First proprietors get claim for it. Is that the locking in principle? I'm trying to remember. Yeah, so, so the, the, the people that yeah. are first settling yeah. the land, and then number one and number two, applying the labor on the land, they are the ones who in the locking system have the entitlement to run the land. And now here comes the kicker, right? So the the Europeans then said in the sort of you know Christian you know missionary zeal that Native Americans failed to um to to reach that objective right because they, because as I said you know it's it, it it's living on the land and it's using your labor to cultivate the land right to grow food on it and the European argument was that because the, the natives people only did the first thing, they only lived on the land, yeah. and then they minimally extracted from the land as much as they needed to survive, but because they didn't cultivate the land, therefore, 
those so-called heathens, um, you know, do not have the right over that land, that um, God, I mean, so in their version, the Christian God, uh, would bestow uh, the the ownership rights uh, to to the European settlers, uh, and 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 therefore has you know gives the European settlers. I mean, basically, the European settlers were giving themselves the right, yeah, to uh, to seize the the native land, um, make their own land deeds and everything, right? Legal, <laughs> make up their own legal documents and such. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, of course, you know, this whole concept of rule of law with um, you know using uh, script, you know, using uh, books yeah. uh, to to justify. Uh, to justify really the original crime, right, the original sin, which is you know stealing the land. Um, but then, but 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 again, you know, it, it was like there was a positive framing. There was a positive intellectual defense that the European migrants constructed based on the the Lockean social theory, right, which is yeah. uh, you know mixing mixing land and labor, right. Um, and um, yeah, yeah, I mean, that's, that, that's the history yeah, of America, basically. Yeah, the history of private property. Yeah, definitely a an issue. Yeah, uh, and, and of course, I mean, it, it means. I mean, but then you might make the argument. Well, I mean, in terms of the per capita GDP and the total GDP, the total population, right? I mean, it is true that. You know, America is the global specimen uh, for success. It's success that's measured in your know, total GDP, GDP per GDP capita, per right? capita yeah. Uh, yeah, output, etc. Uh, America is the specimen for success, uh, and, and so this is what uh, what Lance and Brecht discussed in that uh, in that podcast on the pioneers, okay. where they're basically saying that the that American culture is reliant on this idea of the pioneers, right? So the, the pioneers were it's the first Europeans that settled the, the, the land, drove out the natives. Um, but then in any kind of future iteration of that, I mean, like, you know, um, when uh, there's a Neil Armstrong, I mean, the, the, the guy that went to the moon, right? Yeah. Um, right, I mean, so that's, that's another frontier, another pioneer work. Um, or I think the contemporary version of that would probably be Elon Musk, you know, like you know, let's look at this Neuralink, let's look at this, uh, you know, the Teslas and uh, and Twitter and whatever else that he's yeah. engaged in. Um, and I mean, it doesn't matter what figure you 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 put on the pedestal. I mean, the the the, the you could say the social tie. The social glue that is holding together the, you know, American, you know, ideological system um, is the is the pioneer, is the innovator, is the entrepreneur, um, the guy who's creating new systems, right. um, you know, and, and and then I think and I think Lance was basically citing the statistics about the richest Americans being. Um, the uh you know first generation basically the novo rich you know the the, the silicon valley the, the, the tech billionaires um while you know in a country like germany it would be um you know quant and Claden, right i mean you have the the heirs of like bmw right well don't uh, forget aldi <laughs> uh, uh, aldi aldi uh yeah yeah they were, I mean, uh supermarket you know the billionaires german billionaires. albrecht right yeah yeah so Echt, yeah yeah there were two be... brothers two brothers albrecht yeah. and Theo, i think yeah 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 yeah, yeah. i mean uh, so, so these are or the, the, the porsche heirs right um so 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 th those would be you know the wealthiest people right it's kind of like you might call them uh the old rich right old rich yeah so you so, so your you're, you're old rich i mean if you are more than you know one generation, right, removed from the original uh, money earners, 
Um, and that's and that, that that's why I mean like that. So the European system, I think, is it's more about stability, right? It's about preserving what we already have, right? You know, what yeah. we already created. We want to keep that thing the same. Um, it's worked so well in the past. And and then the American ideology is like you know, you have to create new things, right? You have well. to create things that never existed before. Um, and you think that's the cultural DNA of American capitalism, even nowadays, like this thrive for innovation, and you always got to make more, more, better profits, better products. Uh, and it's in a in a it's a new kind of Protestant ethic, if you want to call it, like a new Protestant economic ethos in the Weberian sense, or is it just something driving entrepreneurship? The goal of entrepreneurs is being the guiding force in the economy, something like that. Yeah, it's it, it's yeah. a it's a core part of the DNA. Yeah, I mean, being you know entrepreneurial, what? innovative, um, and I mean it. it, it so. Yeah. If if you think that if you want to make the argument that civilization is good, right? I mean, unambiguously good. Um, then yes, you need to have somebody who is like America, right? I mean, because because otherwise, then the, the whole world is then going to go back to the you know spiral of stagnation, effectively. Um, and uh, and and we would just you know, live off the um the acquired wealth of the past. Um but 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 that's why I think that you know the the, the climate emergency is, is is quite an important um you know objection point because I mean because the the issue is that so far like there is no genuine objection that you could raise about you know capitalism growth civilization right um you know wanting more and more stuff um i mean you can make the cultural critique you know so you go back to the frankfurt school the adorno horkheimer you know the well, uniformity don't forget, too. don't forget Weber, theory of the leisure class that's a classic <laughs> yeah yeah i mean yeah the, 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 the invidious nature the invidious uh, the comparisons between you know, basically the, the upper class and then the people that are slightly below them, right? Upper middle class. Um, keeping up with Jonas's. I mean, of course, you can make the cultural critique of capitalism, but I but I think you know, look at this. I, I my take is that the, the 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 cultural critique um is is is, is a spiritual critique, right? I mean, it's about like you know, is there something more to human existence than making money and maximizing utility? Um, and I think these are very fair questions to uh, to debate. But in practice, I mean, those voices of, you know, cultural anti-capitalism, if you want to call it that, um, usually get sidelined based on Based on the practices of the capitalist economy, the you know, because you know, what I mean by that is the capitalist economy will keep keep on spinning. You know, people will keep on starting new businesses. They keep on switching their jobs. They keep on buying new cars, new houses, and so I mean, it, like the, the 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 practices of human society will basically drown out the the the, the cultural critics, right, of that system. Mm. Um, so that's why I think that this the objection to capitalism is not so much cultural, um, though it's it, systemic. There would be there would be legitimate to do that. Mm -hmm. it, it it would be the climate. The climate is okay. the main, main objection, right? Because, yeah. because it's the growth, right? <laughs> yeah, because it is it is a, it is a hard limit on the growth, right? It's this idea that you have the social systems. Right, the social systems is built on economic system of, of of growth, and then that economic system of growth, which is then in turn 
built on the um sustainability of you know nature basically and the assumption being that there's enough resources that uh, will be available to us that we have enough you know cobalt and nickel and yeah, fossil fuels lithium <laughs> lithium yeah um and all of the things that that we kind of need um for our you know i guess new and you know, like manufacturing revolution um and also the assumption that the climate is going to be comfortable enough for us to live in the next thousands of years in the same way that we have done uh, over the last, I want to say, three million years. Because you have, to, you have to go back three million years to find average temperature levels that are comparable to what we were facing not even last year. I mean, we're really talking this month, July of 2023. I mean, the long-running average, 16 and a half degrees Celsius. Mm -hmm. And the old, the old record is something like 16.9. And now yeah. it was like 17.1 to 17.2. So that's like point Global seven record. over the yeah over that uh, over the long running average. So, and then and and then a lot of indicators are not looking positive. I mean, um, if you look at you know the temperature of of the oceans, right, which is enormously high. Right, I mean, and and that's of course problematic, right? Because um, because there's already so much heat that is now trapped um in 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 the water, and it's only a matter of time that it's like gets released. Um, and the way how then the releases happen is uh, usually evaporation, right? Stronger evaporation of oceanic water, and that evaporation then means you know cloud cover and then cloud cover means you know downpour usually somewhere in the world so i, mean, I, I saw i think it was yesterday or two days ago it was in milan they had you know heavy hailstorms mm -hmm. um that you know they haven't seen in a long time right yeah start getting uh, tornadoes in germany even <laughs> there's tornadoes in germany yeah, yeah. Now yeah. we're in nor northern regions. Yeah. Unheard yeah. of. All right. I heard in, in, in the US too. I mean in the yeah. um you're starting to hear of tornadoes like in Ohio region and Pennsylvania. Um yeah, I mean it used it used to be that the core tornado region I think would probably be further west, right? I mean it would be like so like just yeah. east of the Rockies, maybe, you know. What's a really a worrisome trend, and I think you nailed this in your essay, is excessive heat, uh, which even Europe has never experienced. And the deaths, uh, illnesses, uh, you know, that are associated with heat related stress. And I mean, even here in Texas, we've had three digit uh, temperatures for a 10, 10 day period. And there's lots of heat related illnesses associated with it. Now, you know, I mean, in Texas, we got a lot of air conditioning, but in places like Europe, you know, even Germany, air conditioning is still kind of a privilege. And I don't, I, as, le as far as I remember, not everybody has air conditioning in, in Germany, you know, in their houses. So when people, when there is this heat wave, it really affects a lot of people. And I think the estimates was somewhere around 50,000 heat related uh, illnesses. And they don't know exactly the number of deaths, but usually it's elderly and uh, people that have existing conditions. But Europeans, you know, usually are not used to that kind of weather and their houses aren't built. Uh, you, you know, they're not, let's say, cool friendly, uh, uh, but they don't have air conditioning either. And um, can you imagine, I mean, what that does uh, for people that don't have air conditioning? And they're hit with, you know, 95 degree weather the first time 
uh, in Europe, you know, like Italy or, or Spain. And so definitely high risk, health related risks and, um, you know, consequences. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I, I saw statistics, but even like in in Arizona, right, um, where you know there's again the, the the heat wave that's quite intense, and now it's killing, I believe, about two hundred people or something. Uh, and I've forgotten what interval. Yeah. I mean, is it going to be per month or is it going to be per year? But uh, yeah. but it used to be that like only a tenth, you know, maybe twenty people used to get killed, right? Um, up until I think 2010 or something, right? And yeah. now there's a massive yeah. spike, and there is no you know, reprieve from those figures, right? I mean, it's not like okay, if we wait another five years, it's going to get better, right? I mean, it, it seems like you know, I mean, one of the most reliable predictions uh, that you can make actually um, is that the temperature is going to you know keep going up. Uh, even further and that every year that we're breaking new records on the temperature um actually is is really an indication for that being the coldest year for the rest of our lives right yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, i know i just, just saw this uh, tweet yeah. just uh, yeah. just before we started chatting yeah it was uh, James Lovelock. I think he's some climate scientist. He passed away last year. Yeah. But he gave an interview in 2008, and he said, my advice to everybody is enjoy your life because within 20 years, um, you know, basically shit will hit the fan. Uh, and uh, and yeah. he bowed out. At least uh, he's sincere about it. He's, <laughs> right? He's sincere about it. <laughs> Open about it. Uh, yeah, yeah, and now this yeah. was. He's not being cynical. Uh, no, he's not. He's not cynical, right? <laughs> yeah, I like it. That's good. Yeah, keep well, going. Yeah, I'm sorry. I mean, it's a, a, any day where you go out and and you're not facing like heat stroke like conditions. I mean, it's going to be a good day, basically going forward, right? Yeah. Um. I mean, that, that that's why. I mean, ultimately, I think. I mean, Andrew Yang talked a little bit about this when he ran for president, but um, there, there has to be a massive improvement in you know carbon capture and storage technologies um, because it's 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 that way that you know if because we 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 cannot just tolerate the fact that uh, that, that at some point the emissions is going to peak. I think we are at a stage where we have to actively find ways to remove the excess carbon in the atmosphere. Um, and so, you know, there's different ways to do that, right? I mean, you can basically create your filters in the factories to make sure that before any carbon gets emitted, it gets captured uh, or, you know, and then it will be stored um, you know, either inside of the industrial product, you know, like cement or steel or anything like that, um, or um, it uh, gets converted into gaseous form and then it's used to 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 grow food. I mean, kind of like a fertilizer. Um, so, I mean, I I I, I don't know the, the precise array of applications that are possible, but but that kind of technology has to get better. Um, but because, I mean, but then there's this issue, right, where there there's this fundamental belief, and so we're going back to this pioneer idea in America, right? Yeah. That there's going to be some version of innovation that's going to save us, right? That's going to save us from the 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 the, the, the trouble of the climate emergency. Um. And so far, I mean, all of the innovations that we have come up with, I mean, even if they're pointing in the right direction, the pace of it is way too slow, right? Yeah. It's like even with the record build out of, you know, solar panels and windmills, et cetera, um, we have not reached peak carbon emissions at this point. 
and you know and the problem is i mean it's it's not even enough to reach the peak carbon emissions i mean we have to eliminate carbon emissions right now still standing at 36 billion uh, tons um and uh, so we you know we don't really have an effective strategy uh, even uh, to move in that direction given that uh, a lot of you know developing countries are still um you know r- rising up and trying to grow wealthy based on yeah. uh, based on the old technologies fossil fuel um yeah but, but I, I don't know i mean if if you read arguments like beyond lumberg i mean he says you know we just have to wait for innovation that's going to be enough mm-hmm. yeah. yeah that's or uh, maybe the state needs to also play a, a bigger role in all of this, you know, <laughs> not depend on just private innovation. Uh, yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, for, I'm a full agreement, full agreement. But uh, yeah, there's, yeah, there's also this argument about like space colonization, right? Oh, yeah, I've mean, heard I mean, of that. I mean, is it possible to move out uh, of the Earth's? hemisphere the the earth's uh, orbits uh and then we could potentially uh you know create living space in outer space i mean think of like the star trek uh yeah. you know space station um it's a little utopian there but let's let's keep going <laughs> it could be yeah, yeah it's, a, it's, it's a little bit utopian i mean it doesn't seem to be <laughs> working logically well i mean because you know we don't have the requisite technologies to make life yeah. bearable uh, outside of the earth um and, uh, and 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 then the intermediate solution by jeff bezos who said that you know we can keep the human populations here and we can outsource the manufacturing you know they're actually polluting uh, the carbon polluting, yeah factories etc we can ship them to outer space. Now, wow. and then the problem is, well, how are you going to transport the goods that are produced? Space elevators. Space factories <laughs> uh, down back to Earth. Yeah. Um, it's not going to be as simple as, like, you know, the Amazon Prime van or yeah. <laughs> the Amazon Prime airplane, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah that, that's, so it, that's, it, it, it's very futuristic, yeah. Yeah, it sounds Seems like, okay. Yeah, it's not going to be space elevators. You're probably going to do space rockets. But then you know, every, every time like a rocket launches, I mean, That's there's some level of carbon that gets emitted, right? Yeah. Because you're still 30, burning. 40 years, 50 years ahead of us. I think we're we're not there yet. I could be wrong, but I, uh, it seems very sci-fi, science fiction. Yeah, I mean, but then one piece of technology I think that is quite interesting, and we've already talked about this a few times ago, um, is you know like Chat GPT and the language manipulation software automation. Right. Um, and I listened to the podcast with uh, Mark Andreessen. He's one of the uh, you know Silicon Valley big investors, uh, computer science guy, and. Uh, and he ba- and he basically made this very interesting point that you know, chat GPT automation targets white collar professionals. Oh. So if you if you think about it, I mean, yeah. So a lot of activities like language manipulation, right, is ripe for uh, chat GPT automation. So if you look at, I, I was recently talking with. Uh, you know, university employee who uh in in the alumni relations office so his job is to write thank you letters to donors of the university right uh, and he he's, he says he's, you know he still spends a lot of time every day to craft unique sentences unique letters and i thought to myself that you know this would be that that this would be one of the core, you know, areas that would be ripe for uh for automation, right? Because I mean, yes. because if you say, well, okay, I wanted to 
individualize the letter. You know, I don't want to write the same thing to every donor. Uh, well, I mean, you could still deal with that with the prompts, right? Right. So write a prompt with like four or five bullet points regarding you know the features, the characteristics of the donor, and you are able to spit out unique sentences yeah. uh, for every single letter, right? Um, but but that just examples it, illustrates like you can reduce work, unnecessary work. Yeah. Yeah, specifically for the white collar professionals. Yeah. Now, okay, so now, now obviously we're sociologists. So I mean, the, the, the like we have to analyze the class implications of this kind of transformation, right? Because it, it, basically, what it would mean is that the, it's the white collar professional class that becomes redundant. We know that the white collar professionals are the ones that command the highest wages in the labor market. I mean, outside, of course, like the executives, the owners of capital, of course, they make way more money. But, but within the working class, you know, broadly construed, the white collar professionals command the highest wages, right? Like your professors, your lawyers, doctors, etc. Mm-hmm. Now, the thing is that what you're doing with language manipulation software is you're targeting precisely those white collar professionals who are operating who are making money through uh, through language manipulation. Mm. And, and then Andreessen makes the point that the tasks that cannot be automated with ChatGPT and similar AI tools uh, are the ones that require some manual skills. Um, but I mean, of course, he's, he's not referring to the manufacturing jobs because you know, that's been heavily automated. So we're really talking about, I want to call them service sector blue collar, oh. right? Think of like your, your food service workers, your, you know, garbage collectors. Yeah, you know, gas station clerks. Yeah. yeah, the gas station staff, uh, the hotel receptionists or the, the hotel cleaners, etc. So it's, it's, it, it's those blue collar service work jobs that are presently not automatable and, and those are already the lower paid ones and then the question is well okay if chat gpt comes in i mean does it mean that the blue collar service jobs are gonna have their wages increased no it means that the wages are getting decreased because what's going to happen i mean th- th- think think of you and me right so okay we got we're highly credentialed we got the phds and everything uh, and now, because you know, Chat GPT basically cuts the number of positions, you know, in the white collar professional sector that would under blue collar professions again. <laughs> that would have accommodated. That. So now we're yeah. being sent back. I mean, I used to be a shoe salesman, right? so I kind of know know how this world is like, you know. And you used to be in the yeah. supermarket, so you know how it's like. Yeah. And so then, okay, then what happens? So you have these highly credentialed people. That are now competing for the same jobs, like the blue collar um, service jobs, uh, as the people with you know lower levels of education, yeah. and so all of these people competing for these remaining jobs. I mean, you can imagine what's going to happen with the wages. I mean, they're going to go down to the toilet, right? Yeah, and a new reserve army of labor appears. <laughs> the new reserve army of labor. <laughs> Yeah, so a redundant, a redundant population. Let's just put it that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, yeah. I, was, and then I was listening to this podcast with Max Techmark. Yeah, uh, he's another one of these like AI futurists and MIT. Uh, and he was saying that well, historically, I mean, if you have like redundant surplus populations, uh, you would have wanted to eliminate those people, right? Which is like a really sad. I mean, the really sad, socially Darwinistic yeah. kind of conception of, 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 of the world. Yeah. Supply demand kind of. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why, and that's why, I mean, it's a big question, like with the, with the UBI debate, therefore it's like, are we, you know, are we doing only bread and circus, right? 
uh, are we doing just cheap forms of entertainment? Are we doing just enough to sustain the population without necessarily giving them a purpose through wage work? Um, well, I mean, but I would still say, that, I mean, so e even if that framing was true, I would still say the bread and circus sounds a lot better to me than, you know, euthanasia, right? I mean, basically killing the Ex uh larry explain to me bread and circus a little bit i need to i need to understand it what do you mean by bread and circus that we're like entertainers or I, what does that mean like well, bread, bread and circus, circus. so it's, it's, as a it's, phrase it's, yeah it's a yeah. phrase that comes from the, the the roman empire okay um so uh because because back, back in the days um uh there was substantial amount of wealth that was created um in the roman empire i mean largely from uh, conquest so you know the right, romans right. they would gather their army and then they would capture new territory and then uh, and, and then they would basically kind of ensurf the population that they conquered uh and then and then, and then they, they would you know basically pay taxes to the roman government uh and and then the roman government could use it on whatever they want uh and then but then there was this issue that if you had people, let's say, from the countryside that were coming in to Rome, uh, and they were ba basically vagrants, right? I mean, they didn't really have a job. Um, and property less, right? Yeah, property less, right? So you couldn't, you know, they couldn't draw revenues from, you know, other serfs, I guess. Right. So what ends up happening is that okay, so so the Romans they 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 couldn't banish those vagrants. So what they ended up doing was um they they build up uh the, the stadium you know like the uh the, like the Colosseum the Colosseum yeah. Romanum which is one of the sites I visited actually like, this past summer oh wow um yeah you know, it's too many tourists anyway right now but um but yeah so it was it, it was an entertainment venue for this vagrant population the the Roman vagrant population, so that was a circus, right? So the 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 circus was basically the gladiators. I mean, if you watch the movie Gladiator, I mean that's, that's sort of the idea, right? So you have people that are have basically uh, captured, they're kind of prisoners, and they, uh, you know, they fight against like lions or something, right? Uh, and then yeah. and, and if they if they survive it, maybe you know they get freedom, and if they don't survive it, they get killed, right? Yeah. Um, but it was a way of entertaining the, the vagrant masses. So that was a, the circus. And then the bread part is that they would uh receive the bread from, from the government too. So they, 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 they wouldn't have to work, right? So they would they they would they would get the daily bread rations and when the belly is full then they go to the Colosseum to entertain themselves and then and then they go uh, and then they go home and then Go to sleep, and then the next day, you know, the same thing again, right? Um, and so that, that that that's the origin of bread and circus, right? So okay, thanks for that clarification. <laughs> so, you know, basically, basically food, know. food and entertainment, right? So you get okay. Um, and and then that's like that, like the absolute base minimum, I would say, of human existence is precisely to have those two things, right? How is that? Different or similar to movie theaters and popcorn in the United States. <laughs> to some extent, I mean, uh, movie theaters offer working class people an, an, an escape from reality. And uh, I guess it keeps them occupied, focusing on fictional stories, but sometimes maybe true stories. But a lot of times, you know, Hollywood and the movie industries. Uh, produce uh, a product that people watch and they're paying for it, you know, they're paying uh, and they're eating popcorn, right? So I don't know if that's a, a modern day Coliseum, you know, but it's not bread, but now it's it's popcorn and and movie tickets or, or even Netflix. I mean, Netflix has similar uh, usage, but it, uh, yeah, like it goes nowhere, I guess. Is that what you're getting at? It goes nowhere and it has no real purpose other to feed a redundant population or to, to fill their free time, the little free time that they do have, or 
again, I'm trying to think of a modern parallel if there's something similar. Well, that, that would but just be the entertainment portion of it. And the entertainment yeah. portion is still commodified. I mean, you you still pay for a Netflix subscription and the movie ticket, right? Yeah. Um, so, so that 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 wouldn't fit the bread circus. I mean, so you have to put these two parts together, right? Where basically it would have to be the government entity, right? I mean, I don't think any private actor would uh, carry out charity at that scale. Uh, you know, maybe church might do that, but uh, but it would be yeah. the state. The state would basically, you know, collect the tax revenues from the people that are still working or the ones that are still producing or basically the owners of chat GPT, right. Of all these technologies, uh, mm-hmm. they would probably be the ones that would still be capable of, uh, furnishing, paying those taxes. Uh, and then they would, there would be a redistribution program through, um, you know, basically a combination of like, you know, food stamps and, uh, you know, let's say free movie theater tickets or something. Right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and that, that's kind of that would be the direction of that the society would presumably take. Uh, and I would still say that the bread and circus vision, I mean, even though it's quite dark, uh, is still preferable to uh, to one where you know you have to practice euthanasia. You know, you have to kill the poor. Um. So, but but then I I, I would still say so the bread and circus. Would, Brand Circus in connection with UBI, I think there was uh, there was a framing of Jung Chul Han in his book. Okay. Yeah. Um, First part of the book, right? Chapter one, I think. Yeah. I That's where you got the quote. Yeah. Was, but yeah. but uh but but to me it's like it's a pessimistic framing. I mean, I have a more optimistic framing of UBI. I mean, for me it's it, it it's it, it it's it's not a ceiling, it's a floor, right? Right. So it's a floor. It's like it's like a minimum that you can stand on, and then you can build on top of that whatever you want to, right? Um, and of course, I mean, if you think that that UBI is a ceiling, right? It's kind of like you know here, and then your ambitions go no further, which is to say, you you get trapped in the bread and circus world, and you seek to not escape uh, that bread and circus world. Um. Then, then yes. I mean, I, I, then I think it's it is very, very pessimistic, right? So I mean, if if like imagine like from tomorrow onwards, I mean, you get a UBI payment, and then after that you don't do anything else, uh, you don't have any other, you know, ambitions in in, in life. I mean, uh, that that then, then yes, then it is a problem, right? Then it's like might, we gave you a band aid, and you know, it's you might you might end up in a ritualistic cycle of some sort. I guess that's what's getting at, yeah. Ritualistic or hedonistic. hedonistic cycle, more or less, right? Yeah. Um, okay, okay. Um, and so, yeah. so there is this yeah. very simple idea of like, you know, like what is the role of struggle and difficulty, like overcoming difficulty in life? And I, was reflecting on that and I listened to the podcast like you know people like Joe Rogan and I listened to Arnold Schwarzenegger and people like that um yeah and and they're like you know muscular types so really it was it was like well why would you put in this kind of self torture to build up your know, muscle mass right and but but I I really like this idea of like overcoming difficulty and performing some kind of struggle, whether it's like physical or mental, right? Um and and I think and I, and I think that element is still that element is still important. I mean, because I think it, it, it does go back to you know an ancient, you know, um I suppose evolutionary program. Yeah. Uh, that, that that we uh, operate under, right? Uh, which is that, you know, there was always some kind of threat that was given to us. I mean, it could be something as simple as like, you know, like a lion that's, you know, waiting, yeah. waiting outside of our, you know, 
cave, <laughs> uh, you, know, uh, to, you know, waiting to consume us. And oh, right, yeah. yeah, and and then of course the people that were sort of like, you know, merry-go-lucky, you know, like take it easy kind of guys. I mean, they'd probably be eaten. They would probably die at that point. Mm-hmm. Um, but then the people that were cautious, right? That I mean, to use your phrase, the precautionary principle, right? I mean, yeah. uh, the, the the people that were actually, measures, most, yeah, they would uh, they would survive, right? They would uh, you know, make sure to kill the lion or escape in time and so forth, right? Um, but I mean, this idea of like desiring something better and then struggling to attain it, I think I I, I think that's that's a deep evolutionary principle and i think and i think it's probably true okay um yeah yeah in any historical time and place yes I, yes i think so um now okay. but then the problem is that i i also don't subscribe to the you know capitalist neoliberal darwinian thinking either right Okay, survival of the fittest. Yeah, Herbert yeah, Spencer, yeah. huh? <laughs> yeah, the, 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 the old idea is like, okay, you know, well, because you need to struggle, so therefore I'll I'll put you know barriers in your way to. I'm more of a thinker like Peter Kropotkin, you know, the mutual aid idea, <laughs> mutual aid versus uh, competition to survive of the fittest. So there's different like different directions that sometimes people take if they incorporate a socio-biological kind of uh, thinking. If they're like Herbert Spencer, they really think that it's all about fit, unfit. The world is about adaptation and those that survive are meant to survive because of nature and those are weak or meant to just die out. That's a Herbert Spencer kind of thought. But then there are others. That's, I think, the Peter Kropotkin uh, types they have this mutual aid idea and they think, well, maybe in look at really closely at nature. I mean, uh, even a, a flock of birds or wolves, you know, they often have to work together even uh, to survive and to adapt. They had to wor- learn how to work together. So they had to sometimes let go of their ego instincts and they had to, you know, be more altruistic. Uh, so, but that's different ways of thinking. Some people think it's all about survival of the fittest adaptation, and others maybe think it has more to do with cooperation and mutual aid. So I wonder if there's a third way of looking at it. You know, For instance, this issue of climate change. I mean, um, some people might think we're doomed. You know, it's going to happen anyway, so let's just... Uh, prepare for the apocalypse you know and others think well maybe as a global community when we came together and we saw ourselves as humanity and tried to uh solve this you know emission issue as a threat to humanity then we would you know don't look at it as a survival of the fittest idea but more of cooperation and precaution yeah yeah, I, don't know, I, mean, I don't know what I just put there together. I don't think. Uh, so the problem is that yeah, yeah. Uh, we, so we live in this very complex system, right? The complex system that operates according to simple principles, right? So the simple principle is like, you know, Weber's rationalization, right? Like counting things up and you know, maximizing the numbers, maximizing profits and growth, etc. Utility, yeah. Utility, yeah. I mean, so, so that, that's sort of like, you know, so it's like, simple principle but then but it's still a complex system in a sense that in a sense that like it, it, like it's it, it's not like i can go to a single person or a single entity you know like let's say let's say the u.s government or the european government or the chinese government right i mean it's, it's not like i can go to a single entity and say to them you're gonna have to do x y and z and if you just do it stringently enough, then, you know, the carbon will go down by this percentage, right? Or it will go down by basically 90, 100%, right? Um, it, it doesn't work that way. I mean, basically, I mean, you have a, a complex system. You have many, many different actors. Well, of course, some people being more powerful than others, that's for sure. But um, but it's, it's, it's a whole system where... You know, everybody kind of 
you know, some some sometimes people work at cross purposes, right? Uh, sometimes people work co like on a common goal, right? Um, uh, but but again, there's there's not one entity that you could target to solve this particular problem, right? And that's what makes it so. That's what makes it so complex, right? Because I mean, even if you say okay, yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, go ahead. I, I convince a few actors to do something about this problem, but I still have enough veto players that can basically make any of those efforts uh, nil and void. Yeah, um, and uh, therefore, I mean. Therefore, I think I, I I think what will have to happen is, you know, things would have to become visibly and catastrophically bad. That in that moment of, you know, Crisis. impending doom, that there are going to be some factions that will become politically strong enough uh, to basically get their way to, uh, to 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 realize. You know, whatever you know, carbon reduction targets. Uh, yeah, yeah. Generally, yeah, we, bad things have to happen, and then people will react. I mean, think about, you know, the the reaction to the Ukraine war, right? When yeah. the, the the German government position, basically until yeah, spring of last year, was that. You know, militarism is a thing of the past, and they would never have to be dealt with again, at least not in Europe. Uh, and that consensus is basically it flipped one hundred eighty percent, one hundred eighty degree, degrees, right? Definitely, definitely, yeah. Now I think there's broad agreement that okay, now it's like okay, higher defense expenditures are actually an intrinsic part of, you know, the European security architecture. Uh, and by the same token, it's like, yeah, it's, it's like the, the worse the climate carnage gets, the more, uh, you know, the more urgency there will be to do something about it. Mm -hmm. um, and that's probably the only hope that we have, right? I want to try to ask something else. I want to, you know, I, I think I previously mentioned this, that I was reading some old parts of Ulrich Beck, and he was making this distinction between relations of production versus relations of definition. So his emphasis was when he defines like this risk society, that really what it's all about is the definitions we use to define, let's say something like a risk, right? Relations of risk. And uh, I was thinking uh, as an example, what it took in Japan um uh, I mean, you know, a disaster like Fukushima, or in the case of uh, Chernobyl, 1986, how this caused the reevaluation of the safety of nuclear power, you know, and how quickly, I mean, even, even though there's still, people were divided on the issue of nuclear energy anyways, and they still are, you know, but this uh, incident, like you said, uh, it takes a catastrophe sometimes for uh, human action to occur. In this case of Fukushima disaster, uh, how it changes the definitions of risk and the kind of energy sources that people use and and uh, that people, you know, there's an international kind of reaction and people are like, look, there's radiation now that's, we're getting radiation counts and stuff like that. I guess my point is, do you think that happens even the way we define, I mean, whether climate change is you know seen as very, very serious or we still have three years, you know, we still have a, a window uh, or some people totally ignore it. You know, there's some climate deniers that just like, that. Oh, it's totally conspiracy, you know. You think that, that feeds into this idea of definitions and how we define even something like risk, you know, or something that is uh, chaotic or consequential? I don't know if that's a long question. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, I mean I guess this goes into framing wars. I guess this goes into framing wars. But we, I was trying to uh, 
you know, we talked about it a little bit briefly. I don't know what your thoughts are on this. Even tr uh, warning trigger words that are sometimes used, even by people that are progressive, you know, like you say something like ecocide or anthro uh, anthropocene or capitalist, capitalozine, <laughs> that's a long word, that uh, the words and definitions we use also uh, uh, create action or, or counter reaction or have certain meanings attached to them, whether the population, you know, also agrees. Does that make sense? Or how the media picks up those topics and then there's also a reevaluation of, of the seriousness. Like, like something like Fukushima. I mean, Fukushima was uh, a real event and it, it caused even internally in Japan a reevaluation of, of you know, nuclear energy and it became an international topic, right? And now I guess it's kind of died down again because I don't know, this, uh, not that big of an issue again in Japan, but I heard it's still uh, serious because they have this polluted water or something that they're going to let go into the ocean. But it's still the, those those two reactors that I think are still problematic. So I don't know. One of your, if you wanted to take on the issue, let's we'll see what your view is. Well, I was saying, I think I think regarding like the climate yeah. situation that. Um, yeah. I, I I think the majority viewpoints. I mean, so I'm not an expert in yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the peer research polling and stuff like that. But I, my impression is, I think the vast majority of people are now recognizing the severity of the climate challenge. Um, you know, so I, I I so I think the the level of disagreement is not so much about the the actual science uh, of the. Uh, of the problem, I, I I think the dispute and the controversy is about what to do about it and at what speed this would have to be done, um, because I think that the conservative uh, political actors um, basically think that you know we don't want to act too quickly. You know we want to act at just the right amount of speed and for them the right amount of speed is uh is is slow the slowness because they, i mean because they the conservatives they want to get to decarbonization well at least the the european conservatives i don't know i mean the republican party in the us i'm not sure where they stand so i think it's probably much more fossil fuel conservatism around there but um uh, but generally, the conservative movement, they want to get to its decarbonization, but they think that there's a much longer time horizon in which uh, this can be done. Uh, because basically, their idea is that you know you never want to step too hard on people's toes. So whether it will be the investors in the fossil fuel industry or you know the, you know, the fossil fuel companies and the workers in those industries, so you don't want to step on them too hard and uh and you want to take everybody along with you to some extent. Yeah. The center, yeah. Yeah, which you yeah, think which is the center is... ground. Yeah. Uh now I, I but I think the the green the green movement they they their argument is more convincing, which is that if you don't go with full speed at this problem, then you're not going to be able to hold the social consensus together, right? Because I mean, at the point at which you have a climate situation that gets so out of hand, so you destroy the crops, you have you know like record levels of like heat strokes, you have you know tornadoes that are ripping through neighborhoods and destroying housing and all these other things. So at that, I mean, if you're reaching that point, and we're awfully close to that kind of you know awful scenario uh you're not going to be able to hold the social consensus together anyway yeah right so i mean i mean because it, 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 the conservative framing about climate change is to say that there's a trade-off between the climate and the economy jobs. Right? Yeah, jobs. yeah so if you if you if you do too much of the climate preservation then it's going to cause jobs, it's going to cause growth, it's going to cause the economy, whatever. Um, but, you know, the, the problem with that um, narrative is that 
you so I, I just one headline that I saw recently it was like in I think yeah. in, um Greece in 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 Rhodos uh, or, or Rhodes uh you have all of the tourists are being evacuated from that island because of uh extreme wildfires that are basically choking the entire island the entire region so a lot of the european tourists they are probably having to go home right uh cutting off their uh, vacation so so i mean with this example i mean you can kind of see i mean you we, right now i mean we're losing everything right yeah is is is, is it's not just is it climate or jobs i mean right now we seem to be losing everything i mean we're losing out on the climate front and we're losing out on the jobs too because it's not going to be a tourism economy if yeah. it, if people are unable to go back to these places to go with tourism right really consequential yeah definitely yeah so basically i mean we're, we're about to lose everything and, and so, but then the problem is like it's very hard to make that case in the conserv- to, towards the conservatives because 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 they don't want to see that kind of negativity, right? Yeah. Like they yeah, they wouldn't when they see the status quo. I mean, you see, okay, this is what we have right now, and right now, I mean, if I'm choosing, I mean, I'm choosing the jobs or I'm choosing the environment, right? Um, yeah. Makes and, sense. Yeah. So so I so, yeah, but the disagreement would I think uh, would be about what to do and at what speed it has to be done. So, I mean, to put put it simply, I mean, there are vested interests when you think of conservative uh, actors that want to maintain the status quo, likely are still on the fossil fuel, uh, carbon fuel kind of economy, and uh, they see their vested interests represented there, and that's all with the energy companies and tied with stocks and portfolios, and uh yeah, that would be self-destructive if 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 they were to change course. So in a way that they might consider uh, accepting risk, you know, accepting a certain kind of risks that, yeah, uh, including climate change. Yeah. So, yeah. So it's vested. It's an issue of vested interest. Another thing I thought about, uh, you know, Veblen uh, brought up several important concepts like, uh, you know, conspicuous consumption. Everybody knows that concept. But there's another one he talked about is called absentee ownership. <laughs> and uh, if you, I don't know if you've heard of it, absentee ownership. And I wonder, you know, when there's a lot of this trading happening, uh, the investor class that uh, they they often own lots of shares, let's say in in British Petrol- Petroleum or Exxon Mobil, right? Let's say you own a lot of shares in these uh, high energy companies that profit off of the uh, carbon emissions, you might say, right? Uh, but a lot of times it's ab- absentee ownership. Again, I'm using uh, Veblen's terms is because they just own the shares, you know, they're owners of the shares and they get the dividends and then they get the value paid from the shares that they own, but they're not really responsible for the environmental pollution. Uh, I mean, in in a sense that they're not the visible face. So I wonder if this starts to create problems the way we usually think of, you know, there's capital, there's non-capital and then there's the state, but the investor class and increasingly also, you know, private equity companies or private equity firms, there's a lot of this absentee ownership where like they have ownership in shares, but they're not held reliable for the damage they do. And then they just get paid out dividends every you know quarter, uh, however that may be. So I wonder if that's a paradox, a paradox of, you know, with investing and investors that have a stake, have a stake in a carbon economy, but are not paying for the risks or, you know, consequences because of a carbon economy. Because they're just investors, you know, and they can just sell their stocks. Eventually, you know, that may collapse. Let's say one day, you know, ExxonMobil, uh, something happens and there's a crash and a run of the banks or something. And then they lose their shares and their value. But until that time, they they get their dividends. And then, they, you know, if you have a 
you own a share in whatever company, you're going to get the value of the share, right? If you decide to sell it. So I wonder why you think about this absentee ownership problem. <laughs> you know, is, is it a problem? Like you, you're, you are an owner of something, but you're kind of immune and absent from responsibility. I mean, you're kind of, you get benefit from owning stock in ExxonMobil, but you're not really, you know, penalized. I mean, I don't know how you would say penalized, or sh let's say shamed. You're not shamed. Uh, well, it's more than shame. What do you think? It's, it's about yeah. you. Yeah. Know, you want the financial flows, right? You want to make sure yeah. that uh, you know the the governments they call it polluters pay principle. Yeah, yeah. Right, where you know we, you want to ensure that the people that are profiting from the fossil fuel sale will contribute to the cleanup. That this is a carbon capture and storage technology. Uh, then also people that are you know, suffering from uh, air pollution because of the excessive uh, smog that gets created with uh, fossil fuel burning. Right. Um, you know, uh, and and you know, so yeah, you want you want to have the polluters pay principle, and uh, and that's of course not realized because of what you mentioned, like the absolute ownership. ownership. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's an old concept, by the way. I, I was just trying to bring it in. I was like, oh, yeah. Well, the economists sure they have this main concept, which is called externality, right? Yeah, external. Is the okay. idea that there's two people that are benefiting from a transaction, but it's a third person that has to pay for the costs of that this transaction generates, Solution, right? Yeah. Um, sort of like with outsourcing, I guess, right? When things are outsourced, uh, or there's external. Uh, movement of industry into uh, uh, you know a low income country, and it's it, there's profit margins or profit made, but the pollution is visible in in that country or is made in that country. But the profits are extracted or benefit benefiting uh, high income countries, right? So it's a kind of poor periphery problem. That's the way I would see it. But <clears throat> yeah. So I don't know. I, I throw that one at you, the absentee ownership problem, because they're investors. You know, again, I'm not trying to demonize all investors and there's some good investors. But let's say if, if you uh, are not responsible for the shares that you own, uh, which could eventually, you know, cause pollution and such, you know, problems linked with the pollution. Right. It could be problematic in the future, I guess. Yeah, I mean, so, but then if you think about so this whole yeah. absentee ownership yeah. and externality problem, I mean, it sounds to me like this is yeah. the, at the heart of the capitalist system, right? I mean, uh, it's a big, yeah. if if we can, you know, so there's this famous saying about like the the French, you know, king, right? So après moi, the deluge, right. right? So after me comes the flood. Uh, so it, it's basically like, you know, the king was being criticized for, uh, you know, irresponsible, like fiscal, whatever, economic policy. Um, and, you know, like stirring up social problems and fighting wars that he shouldn't be fighting, etc. And he just says, well, you know, after me comes a flood. That is to say, you know, by by the time that the costs are due for the problems that I caused, uh, I'm 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 dead. I'm long gone. Yeah. And it will be yeah. next generation that will handle the problem. And, and 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 that has been that that's been capitalism from day one, right? I mean yeah. I mean because if you think about it, I mean I mean it's like you see you have a snow mountain Right. And you have the, the the snowball at the top, which is tiny, and it and it rolls down the hill. Yeah, and it's bigger and, and, bigger. and it gets bigger and bigger. Uh, and then by the time that you're like, oh shit, we we got to do something about it. I mean, you have an, you, have an, you have the avalanche, right? I mean, so the, the whole village <laughs> in the valley is going to get wiped out, right? Um. Yeah. So. Uh, and and that, that that's that's kind of where we're at, right? Where it's like, well, okay, if you're 
you know, if you're one of the early investors, right? If you're if you're one of the early people getting in making money, I mean, you're skimming off from the from the top of that mountain basically. Um and then if you're at the very bottom, I mean if you're living in that village, it's like, oh yeah. It kind of sucks, right? Because you you're gonna be paying the, yeah. the cost of it, right? I like that metaphor of the, the snowball. Believe it or not, uh Ulrich Beck had a similar one. He called it uh, the volcano of civilization. <laughs> the risk society is this volcano. We're living on a volcano and it's fixing fixing to erupt, you know. And we don't know we're on it. So he had this real uh, dystopian kind of framing of it. Yeah, but it's so like that. I like it. Yeah, he called yeah. it the volcano of, on the volcano of civilization. That's what he called it. <laughs> yeah, but there's this one point I don't like about this particular metaphor, which is that. Yeah, okay. Um, it's too negative. <laughs> no, no, no. That, 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 so it, it removes the human agency portion, right? Okay. So, uh, and I, I mean, maybe That's my true. example is also poorly chosen, right? Because they use the yeah. natural metaphor, but the idea is like is a volcano. Well, I mean, it's a force of nature, right? So there's nothing that yeah. humans can do to stop the volcano. I mean, unless you you know move out of that region and you know yeah. far away. I, I want. I think. He, yeah. I think he meant the civilization is the volcano. I don't so want to say he think he thought of it as a natural metal. A metal he, he thought the the human modern civilization is the volcano itself, and it That's sort right. of self erupts. So. There's back. So there's is, some, I'll I'll send you the link. It's it's kind of interesting. They use this metaphor. He uses this metaphor of the volcano, but he uses this, I think, to describe modern civilization is in itself a a volcano fixed into erupt. That's that's the idea. <laughs> well, and the, and the important idea is that it is our yeah. it is our doing, yeah. right? I mean, it's not our yeah, choice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's our, our doing, agency. Right? Our agency. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, we we, we we have done it, right? I mean. Yeah. And, yeah, definitely. And, and, Human agency. That's a good. That's a good uh, way to re-examine that we don't describe that as a thing. That we understand that that is human action that creates these problems. Because that's what you mean, right? Human action. And not describe yeah. it as a thing that's uh, it's all human will. action causes it, but it's not human choice, right? Right. Okay. Because yeah, I mean, like, it's it, it's a it's a collective choice, but. Yeah. But a collective choice is not a real choice, right? Yeah. Because, I mean, in a sense, like, so, because I can only act as an individual, right? If the individual says, okay, I want to opt out of the system, but there's no way how I'm going to opt out of the system, right? I mean, like, am, am yeah. I am I going to, you know, move out of the apartment and I'm going to go, you know, live out, you know, out in the woods, in, in the forest somewhere? You, and You could. There was a guy named Thoreau, you know. David Thoreau, right? Is that his name? Yeah, he lived out in the woods. <laughs> yeah, and 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 then, and then basically so, produced no carbon anymore, right? So yeah, Free, yeah. Whatever clothing so, that I have right now in my body, I mean, <laughs> that's going to be the the only clothing I will ever wear, right? And yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then and then I will, you know, shit outside nature, I guess, and uh, you know, I will I will hunt my own food and stuff. Uh, yeah. and, and and we're not going to do that, right? I mean, we're not going to unwind. Yeah. At least not voluntarily. I mean, of course, if uh, if if the climate situation gets so bad that you know the, the only survivors, uh, you know, the only human survivors are going to be the ones that uh, can live out in nature and survive out in nature, um, then yeah, then maybe we have to do it. But yeah, but as, as but as long as civilization stands, right, we're gonna remain. For as long as possible, the beneficiaries of that civilization, right? Exactly. We, we, we're really going to be okay. Going back to the volcano metaphor, I mean, we're gonna we, we're going to hang out uh, on the on the edge of that volcano opening, uh, and uh, until the eruption happens, basically, right? Realistically, I mean, it's like I mean. You, Again, because none of us is saying that we want to quit civilization, right? Right. At least not voluntarily. That's the key, right? We don't, we don't voluntarily quit it. I mean, of course, we might have to do it anyways because yeah, the climate emergency just gets worse, right? Yeah, um, there will be no alternative <laughs> once it erupts, right? 
Yeah, that, yeah. then it's like you know you just you just deal with the consequences, and so and so I mean so that, that's why I mean I I do go back to this James Lovelock um, statements, yeah, yeah. you know, you know whatever day uh, that you can enjoy, you should definitely do so, right? Because I mean. You know, this year, you know, despite all of the records heat, I mean, this is the coldest year for the rest of our lives. That's true. I didn't think of that, especially and, in Texas, by the way. <laughs> and next year, yes. next year, when it gets a little bit warmer, I mean, it will still be that yeah. year will then be still the coldest for the rest of our lives, probably. Right. But isn't there a paradox that this becomes in a self-fulfilling prophecy either way that we're damned if we do, damned, damned if we don't, that it's like. Paradoxically, it's, I mean, there will be a human action, but this will still take time to have any effect on temperature. I mean, I don't know if it's damned if we do, damned if we don't. And then it, since, like you said, it's going to be always the hottest, uh, and we'll never have the coldest again. There's yeah, hope. There's a yeah. principle of hope, right? There's principle of hope. That there's some kind of a yeah, so, uh, yeah, so, yeah, carbon yeah. capture, and you know, there's oh, we're all going to go figure out the way to go forward but it's like damn if we do damn if we don't no no it, at least it, this it, generation it, this generation you know this generation maybe next generation I don't know. maybe but, generation. But, but still i mean in, in that framing i would still say damned if you yeah. do is better than damned if you don't right okay we, 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 optimism, we, right? it's still it's still modulally better right so so i was listening to this interview with uh obama recently and he was asked about the climate emergency and he said that realistically, I mean, we're not gonna get to one point five C. Yeah. We're probably gonna miss the two the two degree Celsius target as well. But he says that if we do everything that we can to get to two and a half or less yeah, than good. three, then it's still better than you know, letting it run away to, you know, four, five, six, right? Right. So, I mean the whole the whole idea is like the, the the smaller the smaller number, even though it's like difficult to achieve, the smaller number increase in temperature is still better than the any larger time. number uh right. temperature increase. And now it's 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 not a very hopeful phrasing, obviously, right? We have to have some hope. <laughs> some hope. Yeah. yeah. But I mean it's but it's still a better phrasing than than to say, you know, we're not going to do, we're not going to do anything. I mean, we're going to, yeah, you know, run, run, run the, the high speed rail off the cliff, right? Basically, yeah. Uh, you know, that that, that that would that would be that would be fatalistic. I mean, there would be saying damned if yeah. you don't. I mean, and then it's like, no, no, you should it should be still be damned if you do. It's still better, right? That's where yeah. that innovation uh, theme comes in. Like you said, uh, we have to hope in innovation and. You know, this some turnaround innovation may be a way to Yeah, I mean that that's one yeah. of our only hopes. I mean, I mean the, the uh, other hope is 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 that you know like an ecological socialist revolution takes over and yeah and it de delivers us from from the from the evil corporate world. But yeah, from 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 the prison of rationalization, right? Yeah. Uh and, and of course, you know, well I guess your populist framing would be uh, the evil corporate uh, world, um, but I mean, yeah. of course, I, I, I like the I, I like to stick with the Weberian terminology. Okay, yeah, yeah, me too. Weberian, mm -hmm. yeah. like, but yeah, nothing keep... mutual aid, right? No mutual aid. <laughs> no. Yeah, you think that's us. utopia? You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, 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 everything that points towards, like, you know, socialistic kind of arrangements. Okay. Uh, at present is utopian, right? Okay. Um, so if you, yeah. if you remember, like Simmel, I mean, he talks about like the. Uh, he always talks about the, like the law of numbers, and in one in one of the early chapters, he writes that socialism, you know, fits with the law of small numbers. Oh. Me me meaning that, that you can realize socialism in a small community. Because because basically what you need is you need to have trust, trust in the community, right, 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 and then because because it's because trust and accountability belong together, right? Because if you want to, 
problem. Yeah, because if you want to live that principle, right, of, you know, like what did Marx say, you know, from each Resolve. according to their um, needs to each according to their ability, something like that, right? Yeah. So needs and ability, right? So basically the idea is that everybody collects, but then also the assumption is everybody works, right? So it's kind of like a reciprocal system. So you need a high degree of trust. Yeah. And you can have the high degree of trust in a small community, right? But not a big one, right? Yeah. Not in a Gesellschaft. <laughs> yeah, and in a Gesellschaft, there's just too many faces, right? It's like, I mean, yeah. I like, I, 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 I don't know what you're doing down in Dallas. I mean, you don't know what I'm doing here in Princeton. So it's like. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's true. Yeah, it's, it is a big world, you know? And the modern world is very sophisticated. It's uh, too many individual uh, interests and concerns. Yeah, but sometimes I'll compete against collective interest, I guess, or class interest. And the right, social so systems that we live on, however, I mean, it's all, it's all like these larger structures. I mean, we're tied to the nation state. Yeah. You know, we 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 we're tied to this international system. I mean, even if I said, okay, I, you know, this is the Eastern European war. I mean, Ukraine is just too too far away. I live in the U.S. You know, why am I funding this bloody war far away? And you're like, well, I mean, but it's an international system. I mean, we're all. We're all tied together. I mean, do you think that if you didn't back up the Ukrainians, that you know they will stop there, right? I mean, it's not going to come yeah. back to haunt us. So, I mean, we're we're all basically in, in the national system, yeah, and, and we're all tied together for better or for worse, right? Um, and, Definitely, yeah. And and it always comes with risks. I mean, overall, I mean, the risks are are great. Um. But then, okay, well, why do we live under it? Well, I mean, because no, there's also benefits, benefits, right? Yeah. I mean, the fact, state system, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Like, the, like the consumption, right? The consumption levels is much higher if I can, you know, buy commodities from, you know, South Africa, from China and whatever, and, you know, from Europe. Um, your standard of living is going to be higher. If you have Definitely. access to the global markets, right? Uh, if you, you're tied to the international system, right? Um, but but it, but it, but it comes at a cost, right? So, um, yeah. So we, would, yeah. Oh, so ba periphery, yeah. yeah. So basically, I mean, our only hope is um, within the within the logic of the capitalist system. I mean, if the assumption is that we're still stuck with it. Um, which I think we we kind of are. Uh, then, innovation is the only hope. You be everything. <laughs> it is like you know we have to be. You know it's 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 a secular come to Jesus moment. Right? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's like we have to, when we have to say. You know, there's some capitalistic innovation. That will come in the last minute, and will solve our problem. I mean, just like um, when we solved the, the the ozone hole, right? Oh yeah, they banned it. Yeah, that's the, right. The, the HFCW, right? It was some kind of well, that, yeah air conditioning. They banned the hairspray. Uh, the gas that yeah. went in the hairspray. Yeah. Yeah, the HFCW. I mean, as, as soon as you ban that, then you know the ozone hole doesn't grow, right? If I recall, wasn't there a time when there was lead in gasoline in the United States and they banned lead in gasoline? Because lead, you know, goes into the air and lead would end up in the rivers. So even uh, gasoline at some point, I think all the way up to the 70s, had lead in it and they had to ban lead. So, yeah, that was a necessary regulation, precaution, if you like, had to be taken uh, for the sake of. You know, like it's linked to you know yeah. cancer and yeah diseases and so uh, lead uh, lead in the gasoline and uh, I think things like asbestos you know asbestos and uh, the way that buildings were used to be fabricated or built and uh, asbestos had to be banned so usually sometimes it's necessary to ban things in the future I could imagine them banning the 
combustion engine in, I don't know, 25, 30 years. Kind of like... Uh, it's still a long system. time horizon. That's a very yeah. long time horizon. I mean... Uh, I guess the EU already did it. Uh, or they're, they're not producing any new cars by 2035. 2035, I think, uh, yeah. I think so, yeah. So that's definitely always... I mean, a, so there's a headache, I mean, on my end, because, you know, uh want to acquire a car soon and um the, the the issue is that so if you wanted to get the electric car i mean there's a big question like if you get a used one yeah you know that the battery is going to basically crap out at some point right 10 years i think that's a 10 year lifespan yeah yeah, yeah. And, and so then, then it's like okay well why does it make sense i mean you can get like a like a Ford Fiesta electric car for like nine thousand dollars, and I was like, "But I mean, no, ten thousand in ten years." <laughs> but, but, but I mean, I mean, I mean, how, how long is it going to last me? Right? It's like yeah. it craps out soon. I mean, with your combustion engine vehicle, you don't have to worry about it as much. And then the other thing is like, you know, it's only convenient if you have the home infrastructure to uh, to to charge it up, right? So because you know, you drive it during the day, then you drive it back home. Then you plug it in, and then the next morning it's fully charged, and you can go about your day again. But, um, but otherwise, then you'd have to take it to a supercharger station, which of course charges faster, maybe one hour or so, right? Half an hour yeah. to an hour. But then it's like, okay, well, then you have to leave your car over there. So yeah. you, it's assuming that you're not doing anything else during that hour, right? Um. So what you, yeah, you sit in your car in order to wait it for for it to be charged. It's crazy. Uh, By the way, if, and I don't mean to interrupt you, but even in Texas, uh, there's a new gigafactory that was built in Austin, Texas. And then the, the newest, I'm not advertising for Tesla, by the way, but there's the newest Cybertruck uh, that was came off the assembly line, I think, this week. Now, the only problem is the cost of this Cybertruck. It's up to 100000 So that's the issue of cost affordability of this you know, EV movement, a uh, hundred thousand dollar trucks. You know, and um, I think I think there's an assumption, uh, and I've seen a lot of these forums that there's going to be some wealthy people that will sell their EVs, and it will be kind of a trickle down idea. That, that will eventually the uh, used electric vehicles will trickle down, but I don't see it happening yet. It's just not at that scale because. Uh, there's EV uh, Tesla, Teslas, you know, uh, unless you're talking about hybrid, you know, the uh, Toyota Prius. But like the Teslas are still forty thousand dollars easy. That's even used for forty five. And the newer ones, like I said, that Cybertruck is a hundred thousand um, dollars. So I don't know if middle class people, you know, can even what upper working class could afford that. You know, that's unrealistic. You know. My view, unless they make it cheaper. I heard, I heard in the Chinese market, they they are definitely developing cheaper electric vehicles. Uh, the same thing with BMW. I heard BMWs trying to make something cheaper. Oh, the Volkswagen Beetle uh, electric version may come out, but that may take three, four years. So, um, yeah, I mean, yeah. It's, it's a big question. I mean, electric yeah. vehicles. I mean, they they sound promising on paper, but I mean the Cost. Yeah, yeah, the the cost and the, the convenience factor, right? The, yeah. the, the, the recharging issue, right? Like, like I do. do can you have like a durable, like used car market, in the same way yeah. that you can have with the combustion engine vehicles? Yeah. Because I mean, if, if if I have the suspicion that, I mean, let's say you drive a car for nine years, and then you sell it, so what what does it mean? It does it mean I only have one more year of, of usage before. The battery gives out. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, so yeah, I'll never. I, I don't think it take another ten years before I'll see an electric vehicle. <laughs> I'll be, you know, older person by the time I get one, unless there's some turnaround in like, you know, in the market. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's just like some weird innovation where, for instance, like imagine whenever you drive on a highway, yeah, uh, it, 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 it's that that it would charge the car. Because of whatever some magnetic factor or something connected. I saw that in a movie. That was a sci-fi film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. I well, could see that. That might be. Uh, 
Definitely a possibility, yeah. Why? Well, where you basically From sci-fi perspective? Build, yeah, uh, yeah you I've have seen, to build I've electric seen lines that. in the roads, right? Um, yeah, and and, and then uh, you could charge it while you're driving it, and then it yeah. automatically deducts money from whatever your account and stuff. Now, uh, the only other concern—I don't know how much time we have left, by the way, for our discussion—but the only other concern I have, Larry, uh, of electric vehicles in hot, hot places like Texas and Arizona, is. Uh, it gets extremely hot and if it's going to keep getting hotter here in the summers what impact does that have on the batteries and they will have to literally develop underground places to just charge these places because it gets so hot and uh you know uh, electric vehicles you know you do have those batteries and uh I'm just curious, you know, what risk. I, I, there have been some cases where they, they caught fire and there was overheating problems. But you got to imagine some really hot places. Uh, so you would have to doing... connect it to the air conditioning device. Yeah, probably. Or, or be some underground, you know, facility that keeps the cars cool. But uh, this has been an issue, I think, here in Texas because the, the streets get so hot. And then you've got a, a wreck or something happening, and then the cars literally overheat. And not just the regular gas cars, but there's been cases of, you know, it just gets so hot. It's like unimaginable. You're 140 degree on the actual highway because of the, the heat is getting absorbed. Um, you know, my brother, he works at airlines, and he, he's telling me, like, it gets so hot on the pavements. Uh, and that's, if that's going to increase the next few summers, you can imagine what kind of problems that may create for vehicles, you know, because they're absorbing all that heat all day. And if they're driving on the highway, you have to stop driving at a certain time, you know, to be a real risk concern. Unlike, I don't know, I don't, I don't know how it was in New Jersey or, you know, but you got to imagine in the South, it's triple digits for two months. So it means either you don't drive for two months, electric vehicle, or you where you you know it's high high risk. Uh, and then you're dealing with electrical and all that. So yeah, I throw that in there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just, it's just another point of risk society, right? I mean, because yeah, I mean, it's the whole idea of like, okay, you know, we can deal with the heat by cranking up the air conditioning. Yeah. And I thought to myself, I mean, isn't isn't it the case like if you have extreme heat, that it could cut the power supply, that uh, you know, will make you lose access to electricity to begin with, and then, and and then you sit there without power and without AC, right? Yeah, it's 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 often life threatening. Uh, now with Texas, uh, AC conditioning uh, consumes a lot of electricity. And it gets to the point, it overwhelms our grid. And uh, they sometimes mandatorily uh, enforce to bring down, uh, to bring up the temperature so that people don't have it down to like a 65 degrees. It automatically goes up to like 72 or 73. And that, that's done automatically so that, that the consumer doesn't have a way to correct that. That's a uh, high peak of times when the electricity consumption is through the roof. And in Texas here, we had several occasions where it got really close and it, it would have caused blackouts. And that's for the homes where people can afford the AC units. You're not talking about people that have window units that are not have air conditioning. And then you're not talking about workplace. So it's not just the homes that people live in, but the workplace, the schools, the um, colleges. It's a Big electric consumption. That's just maintaining electric, uh, AC conditions. Big business. It's a big business. Um, and uh, it, it takes a big chunk out of electricity consumption, but also it, it takes, yeah, it's enormous. So, yeah, I remember yeah, this one line in the US yeah. history book, uh, yeah. history book lesson, which was about um, basically the rise of the Sun Belt, right? So, the Sun Belt yeah. states like Arizona, Texas, and also Florida. And uh, Georgia, and what's quite interesting is that so the main argument is that it was made possible by the widespread usage of air conditioning, right? So because before ACs, it's like you know you have to live in regions that are 
you know, hospitable, right? So probably like the Northeast yeah. or maybe the Midwest. Um, and by introducing air conditioning, now you're, you know, you're able to shift, you know, yeah. office spaces, professional work, uh, to you know, to to the south. Yeah. Um, and mm -hmm. it's interesting, like if you look at post-COVID migration, so yeah. among the U.S. states, I mean, you know, like Texas, Florida, right? Georgia, Arizona, I mean, those are just Tennessee, maybe. I mean, so these are the main beneficiaries of oh, man. of the of the of the post-COVID migration, right? Where there's like more yeah. remote work and more flexibility, where to live and stuff. <laughs> yeah. And uh and then like the, the northeastern states are kind of the, the losers, right? Which also have higher taxes and stuff. And so I was wondering, I mean. Yeah, is it? It's like it in in the in the climate future that we are kind of expecting, right? Yeah, it's like well, why is it that you would want to move further down south? I mean, closer to the equator. You know I mean, this is it's it's a real, this is a real big mystery, right? I mean, where it's like I mean, okay, yeah. okay, because we can define nature with air conditioning, right? That's that's ultimately the short term answer, right? Well, it's also the paradox of freedom, you know, I mean, paradox is that it, you have more open mobility, you know, everybody can move where they would like, and everybody could live where they would like. Uh, but the paradox is that, I guess, the ecological reality is that you cannot air condition the entire South, you know what I mean, as the region. And air conditioning is just an artificial means to create an environment that pulls a certain space. But uh, even that is fictional, you know. I mean, it's fictional that you, you you can you can you can cool down a room. You can have AC in your car, but you cannot cool the outside. <laughs> and some people are arguing that it makes the matters worse um, because not only are you consuming a lot of electricity, right, uh, but you're creating these artificial spaces that are artificially that have nothing to do with the ecological reality that people live in outside. And this is where that problem uh, is created, like in Las Vegas. Uh, you know, they may have AC conditioning uh, in their units, uh, but outside it's 120 degrees. You know, let there come a moment when the electricity does go off. You know, how can people, are people able to adapt? Um, and I can tell you, this, this is very serious. Uh, I even have my own brother. He had the situation where his, his uh, car AC went down for a day. And you're talking 120 degrees inside a vehicle driving in, in Dallas traffic. How horrible that was. So the, our bodies are, are not... Even, even with the windows it's, down, right? Yeah, with the windows down. <laughs> and and what I'm saying is, is that AC kind of is an artificial attempt to create a cool environment which is still artificial you know but in, in our minds we think well we can kind of lift through this heat if we just all have ac conditioners and we install it in our houses we install it in our cars you know this there's, there's fans and all sorts of attempts to cool it but it comes to a certain point where you cannot cool the entire environment there you know you still got to go outside you have to walk to your car you have to walk to work and this is where it gets critical. Uh, in some places, for instance, when I shop, uh, there is so much heat when you get out of your car, that distance to go to your grocery store is where it hits you the hardest. So this is where they haven't solved that problem. It, that, that transition, that walk, even if it's, uh, let's say, 25 yards, 50 yards, and you're in that vehicle, you get out, the AC conditioner, you know, was in your vehicle. Now you're walking out, right? And now you're at a Costco parking lot. Just imagine you have that pavement, right? Pavement, all that heat has been absorbed all day. And you get hit with 140 degree heat, right? By the time you walk to the Walmart entrance, you you might have a heat stroke. You might have a heat stroke. Seriously. And that's what often happens. It's you cannot air condition really the entire uh, you know 
space. You can re you can, might be able to air condition a vehicle, a, a building, but they haven't gotten to the point where it's everywhere and everything. And that's where people usually pass out. It's just walking from the grocery, you know, their car to the and entrance. And it's primarily the elderly and the immunocompromised yeah. threat. Yeah, yeah. It's really interesting, though, because it, it kind of exposes, I think, the paradox of uh, thinking you can create an artificially cooled space and people are sold on it. You know, like, well, we, we, we can uh, build, you know, AC units here and AC units there, but you can't put AC units everywhere. You know, I don't, I can't even imagine electricity consumption. I mean, it, and that's, by the way, another thing, uh, the months of uh, the summer are the, the highest electricity consumption days and also the highest bills that people receive in a, in a hot summer months because they just consume so much electricity so, yeah, so that's global you. warming plus capitalism it's like together you know it's like plus you got heat plus you got you know there's there's electric company there's all sorts of uh profit making off of it you could suggest there's some um necessity of uh lecture uh, ac systems yeah because you know again it's about this idea of like you know, we are still the recipients of civilization yeah. and we want to nibble at the benefits of it for as long as we can, right? That's that's the basic idea. Uh, and so I, was, I, was, I, I saw this one futuristic article about Singapore, which is, you know, it's a big city, global city around the equator, right? So it's a very hard region. Uh, and basically they have like tropical summer all year round. And there's this idea to basically develop like underground cities. Oh wow. Right. Where, where that, so the whole concept is that you build um like okay, so so it's it starts with like the shopping malls, right? Yeah. yeah. That's, that's, that's oftentimes what it starts with in mean, the urban design, right? Which is like, you know, creating um, you know, cons consumption spaces. Um but but then surrounding these uh, shopping malls that are, you know, connected, basically, like, think of it like a giant tunnel, right? Right, right. Um, but then, right next to those shopping malls, you would build these residential facilities. Um, you know, with, like, rooms with actually multiple floors, so, like, you can actually go deeper down. I mean, like, I mean, think of, like, several basement floors, effectively, right? And... And I was like, I mean, it, it still kind of sounds a little bit horrible because, I mean, each of these apartments, as you can imagine, they don't have any windows, right? Oh, no. So you, 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 you're you basically, you're stuck in the basement. I mean, like the, the only thing maybe that you could do is like, they have like maybe like a ground floor, right? Um, uh, Which is maybe the center of the shopping mall. And then in the ground floor, you might have like a, you know, I mean, everything is still indoors, right? You have like the, the glass ceiling, right? And then, and then that's where you get the that's where you get your sunlight, right? Um, but 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 the whole idea is that you know that 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 you, that you never like for all of your needs, you know, whether they, so office spaces, yeah, the yeah. shopping mall, and, and the residential facilities, right? So you technically, you know, you never have to leave the the air conditioned indoors. You know, in order to to live your life. Now, I mean, this is a futuristic concept, so I don't think that they're fully there, right? I mean, of course, they have yeah. a lot of things uh, outdoors still, but it's but 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 it's but it's a concept that is being uh, discussed yeah. discussed uh, in response to the to to the global warming, right? Um, and yeah, I don't I don't know. I mean, it's it sounds, I mean, of course, like in order to sustain human life, I mean. Maybe this is yeah. what what ends up happening, right? But yeah, mm -hmm. uh, I, they will they will need to figure it out because like it it, it will get too hot in some places uh, for humans to be outside in a certain time. So when night, I've already seen night living becoming common, I guess, in the summer months in the south. What I mean by night living is people do most of their daily activities at night. And a lot of the industries cater to the reality that 11 uh, a.m. to 7 p.m. is is nobody goes outside. So 
a lot of the businesses adjust to this and then they have longer hours. Uh, and so there's some night, I think I, that's why I call it night living. People are kind of adjusting, but this whole, like, again, I'm, I'm criticizing this whole thing of thinking that one could just put AC conditioners you know, uh, everywhere and cool off uh, spaces is, you know, so what, what's the temperature difference between you know the nighttime and the daytime? I mean, in Dallas. Well, uh, well I can tell you right now that here in Texas, uh, we reached 108 two days ago, and it was at 5 p.m. 108 degrees. Okay, oh, that excludes heat index. Heat index uh, is when you add in um, moisture, humidity. It can go up to 120. So even though it's 108. It feels like one feels like one twenty. Oh shit! But here's a kicker. Here's a kicker. When you think of the pavements, the uh, asphalt, yeah, the concrete, it can absorb. It can be twenty degrees higher. So even though it's one hundred eight, it might be one twenty five, one thirty on the street. Okay, and then it it keeps absorbing the heat, and it doesn't cool it down quick enough, even after sundown. Okay, so. So it it even though it might go down after 8 p.m., it might start going down one degree every let's say 15 minutes. It will not cool off uh less, you know, it will not go below 95 degrees. It will still be 95 degrees here tonight at 1 a.m. So that means even if you're at six o'clock in the morning, it might be at 85 degrees. So the problem is that it never cools down enough. And this is problematic in urban spaces, cities, because the heat is so absorbed in the concrete, in the buildings, that it is unable to cool down. And that heat uh, will continue to get worse, you know, because, you know, like it gets hotter and hotter. But it overwhelm, overwhelms the cooling systems of cars, of AC systems, of business AC systems, and that consumes even more electricity. Like you're trying to cool something down, but it's just unable to do it. And um, it's a, a serious problem. And it like creates health health problems. Elderly people can't you know, go outside at a certain time. Pets can't go outside. They can burn their paws, you know, stuff. Uh, it's deadly for animals. It's uh, destructive for uh, any kind of plants or things. Like it's really ridiculous to... to uh, have plants outside because they get burned. <laughs> uh, but some people artificially try to do it. Some people try to have artificial kind of lawn, lawns where they have watering systems, which is, again, ridiculous. I think they ought to ban that. But, uh, yeah, this is just a cycle. Uh, and in the South, it's particularly a, a problem. Yeah, but I understand, like, the whole gardening thing. I mean, even in yeah. the desert, because... <laughs> Because there's something archaic, right? When we see something that's green, like a green yeah. space, then yeah, I think I, I think our mind associates it with life, vitality, activity, right? Which yeah. is much better than than like desert, right? Uh, well, they are trying to sometimes put in fake uh, trees, like plastic, or those trees that don't require water. <laughs> uh, yeah, but it doesn't have any cooling features, right? Yeah, yeah. Because I mean, if you think about it, like the the cooling yeah. features, they come from the the like the tree shade, right? Yeah. Uh, so if you have like the the the, the leaves, basically. Um. So because I mean, if you think of like a, like a like if you stand in building shade, like it cools you down a little bit because it blocks the direct sunlight, the sun rays. But it doesn't cool a lot, right? Yeah. Versus if you stand in the tree shade, like it cools in two ways because first it blocks the sun rays, and also because the 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 the, the heat of the sun it's resolved, absorbed, yeah. Uh, yeah. Re 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 well, results in the release of moisture from the leaves, yeah. and then and and, and, that. That, and that release of moisture is uh, is like a cooling agent, which is the reason why. Like if you stand under a tree shade in a summer day, uh, it it feels much cooler than, yeah. You know, of course, under the sun and, and under a building shade, right? Um, That's true. And, and, so, and, and then the good news, I mean, so well, no. so, so I was in Vienna like last summer, not not 
for right. this one. I left earlier this year, but um, but I remember last year was a really bad, really hot summer, and there was no rain at all when I was there. Um, and but it, at least and, and almost nobody had air conditioning, which is really what you know upset me as a. I suppose as a Yankee, right? Um, um, but but at least the nighttime was okay, right? So this is in the nighttime, like after 10, 11 p.m. I mean, it does cool down to um, sixty-five or something. Yeah, it's like it's, 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 yeah, it goes, it goes down to the sixties. So I mean, you could still like if you like if you if, if you left Hold the window the window open, right? Uh, there will be a little bit of a breeze. Uh, and then, and then of course, I mean, you sleep without a blanket, right? Um, but uh, but but it will still be it will still be okay, right? Um, That's good. And you can still fall asleep. I mean, but then I but then I heard also that even the European countries, I mean, in, in the central and the northern European, because the southern European is is scorched right now. I mean, it's terrible. But yeah, so even the, the central and the northern European, I mean, they're kind of like not used to you know tropical days at all. And especially not tropical nights, but but the predictions are that you know there will be more tropical nights um, happening, and and the tropical nights are basically twenty degrees Celsius, which is I guess you know, like low seventies, right? So you know if you have yeah, and if you have a tropical night, I mean the the thing is that when you go to sleep, um, you need to have the the lower surrounding temperature, right? In order you, to fall asleep, yeah. In order to fall asleep, yeah, because you because because also like while you're asleep, the the body temperature drops too. Now the the problem is like, you know, like like if if you're already at the wet bulb temperature outside, I mean, like there's no way for your body to cool down, and then and and if your body cannot cool down, then you cannot sleep well, right? So, um, so this, that, that's that's a big problem. Now, now obviously, like. If you have the air conditioning, then that's never, that's usually not an issue. But uh, I guess that's for richer households, right? I mean, it's it's more of an expensive luxury in, in Europe. True. Yeah, so far know. it's a luxury. I mean, yeah, um, even in cars, right? They don't all have AC conditioning cars. No, they, with they the have cars, heaters, they, they, they have the, heaters, the cars, cars? They, they're building them in. I mean, the, the okay, modern okay. cars they have they have them all. Oh. Um, and then and then also like the public transportation, they have them all now. Like all, all of the new wagons. So you guys, when when I when I grew up in the nineties, I mean they still had the old wagons that were introduced in the sixties and seventies. Yeah, yeah. Um and, and, and they had no air conditioning. So back then you had to you know, like you had to you know, on the summer day you had to pull down the the, the window. Right. And then you have to get Yeah. The, the, the wind, I, I remember that. The wind from the movement, right? Um but now I think the all of the new wagons, the ones that were introduced after 2010, let's say, um, they're they're all fully air conditioned. Um, but then, uh-huh. but then I do remember I used because I just took the OBB once and and they had to, there was a summer day and they had air conditioning, but it was so weak. It was it just blew like a like a light wind. Which I mean, so again, like you know, if if you're used to Yankee standards, <laughs> right? Where basically, like, if if you go into any shopping mall, like it, like as soon as you walk in, I mean, it blasts like the cold air, like really strong. Oh wow! And then, and then when you make it, and when you make it through, I mean, into the hallway, then, then it's it's still quite strong, but it's like you know, not as strong, right? Mm. Um, and, and so I mean, and, and I and and I have this sort of like vision that you know the american air conditioning is um that you get in the shopping malls i mean that, 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 yeah, that that's the normal standard right yeah it will happen in europe too i'm pretty sure it gets yeah, hotter they'll, yeah they'll put in the strong air conditioning yeah of course yeah because yeah. they, they have the funds to do it but then you have to consider that i mean because right right now i was i was wondering because the 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 carbon emissions Per capita in the European countries is lower than the American one, right? So the Americans they have a higher per capita uh, emission, which I was wondering what it is connected to. I mean, is it that okay? Well, 
we are a more car dependent culture, so you know, obviously we have to drive more cars. Um, you know, oh, definitely, yeah. yeah we use factories, air and production, and trucks. Uh, more emissions, highway length, uh, just amount of near production. Yeah. Yeah, and then also we use air conditioning are... and heat. Yeah. And then, and then one thing I mean, so so I'm not, I'm not sure. So the the yeah. newer buildings, I must assume like they are built according to the highest uh, heat insulation standards, right? Like, you know, like yeah. the the windows and the walls and everything, right? So making sure that 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 you can actually kind of you know create a barrier between the outside and and the inside. Yeah, uh, I mean the U.S. or Europe or or both. I, I think in both in both continents. Yeah. Um, well, well, don't worry, uh, forget that in uh, in some states people live in trailers, trailer uh, park or non brick homes. So that could already no be. I mean, it's uh, it's it's not like European situation where everything's brick homes, uh, but in the U.S. it's more common for people to have you know a trailer. At least in the south, I mean, so it's a different kind of design of buildings. Yeah, you've got brick homes, you've got townhomes, you have apartments, but there's a lot of people in the country that live in trailers. So it's it's a kind of building that's uh, creates more emissions. It's yeah, it's not like a brick home. So it's it's also manufactured more cheap cheaply. You know, there's a different kind of. Uh, materials that are built to make it that's why it's often at risk when there's a tornado the, the buildings are just not built the same way like a brick home is they had that problem in florida florida had a lot of these badly designed uh, houses that were really had weak infrastructure weak weak uh building parts weak weak uh plywood you know it wasn't like a brick home so you can imagine that creates different emissions uh, because it takes more energy to, to heat it in winter time, and at the same time, it it, cr it creates a problem because it takes more energy to cool it too. <laughs> a lot of the trailers have you know problems with cool, uh, keeping it tight, so that's why it was a lot more energy waste. That, that, that's what I was going to say. I mean, like because yeah. I think I think the older houses, I mean the regular houses in the U.S. I mean, yeah. They have very poor heating insulation standards and versus, I mean, even the yeah. older buildings in in Europe. I mean, so I, mean, I grew up in an apartment building in Vienna that was built in the 1920s, I want to say, right? Okay. And I, I must yeah. assume there have been like several like heat insulation renovations over the years, but 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 over there, I mean, it's like even in the winter time, right? If you if you didn't run your heater at all. You would still get to 16, 17 degrees Celsius, which is quite cool. I mean, you'd have to wear a sweater and whatever, yeah. but, but it would still be tolerable, right? Versus like, you know, if I try to do the same thing, you know, not running the heater in the winter in Philadelphia, I would remember, I mean, it would go down yeah. to like, you know, nine or 10 degrees, right? <laughs> which, yeah. I mean... We, I mean, it's 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 like it's like a fridge, right? I mean, there's there's nobody can live in that, and that's why, yeah, yeah, you know, that's why you had to crank up the heat, and then it's like, well, okay, but then you'll be paying electric bill three hundred dollars, uh, you know, in the heating, the gas, right? So, um, yeah, it's, pay yeah, it's, it's the payoff, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's why I mean, I was like, so that's why I mean, I I was hoping that like for new building standards. Yeah. Right, that you make sure that the the insulation is like is like at at the maximum possible, right? Because you can say, well, the material costs more money, but then, like, how much money are you spending on the heating bills? I mean, it's probably like, you know, one year of extra heating bills that that that, that you would devote instead to to do the heat insulation, right? And if you live in a home for multiple years, then obviously you make the money back, right? It accumulates, yeah, accumulates. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, yeah, so I would, yeah. Uh, call the hey, it was good. Yeah, good it was discussion good. today. Um, yeah. Yeah. Great. So thank you very All much right. for coming in. Uh, oh yeah, yeah.